Okay. All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, thanks for coming out to the council meeting tonight. Uh, so the first thing to do is call the meeting to order, so I'm doing that now. Uh, next is to review and approve the agenda. Uh, there were a couple. Um, oh, hello. Okay, we're, we're a little better. Okay, thank you. Um, all right, so there are a couple of addendums to the uh, agenda as posted online, um, which uh, are in the consent agenda. Um, so we have an item I and J uh, about um, street closure and pancakes, which is pretty exciting. Uh, so I think there's, I don't think there are any other changes to the agenda. I just have, oh, yep. I just wanted to note something. The council at the last meeting had set um, the continuation of chapter three of the ordinances for tonight. And I know at least one member had asked about that. And um, when we started going through the notes from the last meeting, we also had some staff that observed some other things. So we wanted to take some more time to vet through that before bringing it back. So hopefully it'd be the following meeting. So that's, we didn't forget. Great. Any other changes to the agenda? This one? Okay. I will do my best. I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do this. Okay, so uh, right, so we're going to consider the agenda approved um, uh, without objection. So on to general business and appearances. So this is a time uh, for any member of the public to address the council on some matter that is otherwise not on the agenda. Uh, and so if you would, uh, if you have anything you would like to say to the council, <clears throat> if you would say your name, where you live, and try to keep your comments to two minutes, and I will give you a heads up uh, when you are at two minutes. Welcome. Um, thank you. I'm Paige Gurton. I'm on the Conservation Commission, and I wanted to let the council know that we have selected a contractor to do the rain garden at the credit union that we've been working on, it seems like, forever. Um, and that is a collaborative team of Equilibrium, which is Sarah and Alex Hoffmeyer, and the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps. Sarah and um, her team member, Elizabeth Courtney, will do the design, and VYCC and Alex Huffmeyer will do the construction. So we're looking at construction in the middle of August, and they are off and running. So That's wonderful. Just wanted to let you know. Do we need to get approval from you for, any, for that? No, I okay. think you're all set. Thanks, we okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, anyone else? Is this general business? Yes, general business. Oh, yeah. Anything not on the agenda? I don't, I'm not sure if this is the right time to comment or not. If it's not, I'll sit down and wait. But I'm Mary Alice Prophet with Down Home Kitchen. I'm the owner of Down Home. And I just stopped by. Um, Jamie Granfield was nice enough to mention that you're having a meeting tonight. And I know that we've had a lot of really awesome street closures happening on Langdon. If this is about the street clo closure, we will talk about that very soon. Okay, that's what I was wondering. So, yeah. Sorry about Sorry that. Sorry to I'll interrupt you. Okay. Yeah. okay, okay. Awesome, thank you though. Um, all right, Any, anything otherwise not on our agenda? Uh, Steve Whitaker, Montpelier. Uh, I want to present you all a gift that what's the point of sweeping the streets to keep the dust from blowing through the farmer's market if you're going to leave the street sweeper behind? So feel free to pass it around. In the plastic bags, it's a lot cleaner than having to pick it up without individually, but that took a lot of work. Uh, a few of them were donated by your trash tramps. I, their choice of words, not mine. Uh, We've got a growing number of hazards with the removal of the trees, the sidewalk concrete work being done. The, there's not sufficient supervision. There's a big four inch gap in, right in front of the Kellogg Hubbard Library. Last week there was a two foot deep hole the size of the missing tree. Somebody could have stepped into that and broken the kneecap or whatever. Not enough supervision of the repairs. Um, the wreath is still sitting right out here from last Christmas, right alongside the city council. 
Uh -huh. So I had asked one of your council members to actually add to the agenda. We need to have a discussion about the uh, housing challenged. Uh, is the nicest phrase I can come up with so far. But I've mentioned this before, it's getting worse. Uh, the folks that, the need for services, right now is the beginning of the fiscal year, and I think that I have asked that you take action tonight to appoint some members to a task force to reach out to Berlin and Barry and see if the uh, funding stream that comes hundreds of thousands, I know you're watching your clock. Yeah, just want to get rid of me as quick as you can. Uh, but I mentioned this many months ago, back in January, and it's still not made the agenda. And if you miss the opportunity to reroute that, those hundreds of thousands and take some more oversight, uh, that will not be a good thing. So you're at about two minutes now, Stephen. I know. I know. Um, and I, know I, I also want to, I'm going to stop my clock for your sake since I'm talking. Um, I just want you to know that there's a, a group of people who've been working on um, homelessness in, uh, in Montpelier and would love to connect you with that group. It's bigger than that. We need action by the council to intercept the funding and take oversight. Let's, let's talk about how we can connect with all the resources that are available. But if you if if they start to flow July one, you may have missed that opportunity. You're a little over two minutes. If you have anything more, yes, our your police force is handing out to some of these housing challenged folks with no demonstration, no evidence of a complaint by the parties, is handing out no trespass orders that don't cite a complainant or anything. It's really a, a let's say an abusive process. It's They're being selectively enforced. Some of the homeless are being run off while others are being left there. That's not okay. Uh, here's an example of one signed by an officer. So, and you're, you're almost at three minutes here, Stephen, so let's wrap it up. Why don't you just tell me you don't want to hear it? And no, these are I, problems that I brought to you repeatedly and you've not put them on the agenda. I would so, love to chat with you further about this, especially over email. That's dysfunctional. No result comes from those emails. So uh, I'm doing it, putting it on the record for the public to Great. put pressure on you. Thank you. Any further comments? Uh, yes. I agree with him about the homelessness. I think it's high time and long overdue that the city do some real addressing of homelessness and um, we need a homeless shelter. Fair enough, thank you. Oh, and would you mind um, saying your name and where you live for the? Vicki Lane in Berlin. Okay, thank I you. Mean, there you go. <laughs> In Montpelier. In Montpelier. Great, thank you. Any other comments? Okay, uh, so moving on to the uh, consent agenda. Um, I know there's a couple of items that we may want to pull. I want to ask if there's anyone here um, to address the uh, toy run. Is anyone who would like to talk about that? It's on the consent agenda. Um, we can pull it if you would like to. Great. Um, all right. So we will. Um, I would like us to pull um, item uh, E as well as uh, the street closure on Langdon Street, um, which is um, item I. Any other suggestions? Is there a motion regarding the consent agenda? Have an item I on the it was an add-on. It's on. It's online. It's an, an addendum. It's on the, to the addendum. Agenda. With one that all the audience has is doesn't have yeah. Fair enough. It's uh yeah, it's on the online version. With those two deletions, I move the consent agenda. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, great. Uh, so let's talk about the um, uh, toy run first. Um, uh, Vicky and Steven? And, and if anyone else has thoughts, great. Maybe we should get an update from Sue or Tony first. Oh, sure. Where we're at. Uh, I don't Sue see and Tony, Sue. do you want to provide an update oh, of there's... where we're at, what's on the actual agenda? Before people comment. I'm 
Sue Allen, the Assistant City Manager. Chief Tony Fagus, Montpelier Police Department. Can you hear now? No. Can you hear now? Yes. Chief Tony Fakus, Montpelier Police Department. Uh, how we resolved it, uh, we adjusted times on both ends, and so the, the street will be clear for the toy run to come through at 1 p.m. The police department also, since we'll have the additional staff that day, we're going to assist the farmer's market folks on, uh, we'll take care of the barricades and cones so they can just pack up and move out, and um, we should be all set to make sure we've got a clear course through State Street. And I wa okay. just want to thank both both um, United Motorcycles of Vermont, as well as the Farmers Market, for their their work uh, with us, you know, on this glitch. That was pretty much our responsibility that we missed. So, I want to thank them. I just want to add also that the fire chief will be there on uh, Saturday to help with the breakdown, and I'll be there. And the Farmers Market is bringing in extra volunteers to meet up to meet the time frame. Okay. Any further comments? Yeah, come on up. Um, I think it's really, I, I'm pleased that there was some movement on both sides, but um, I think this year maybe, especially considering what happened in New Hampshire, that the motorcyclists should be given um, a lot of leeway on this. And I think looking forward, since it was mentioned that the uh, farmer's market had already booked every Saturday for next year, uh, let's change that and fix it for the toy run. They're only asking for one Saturday. It won't kill the farmer's market to adjust. Um, just to clarify, uh, we've not actually booked anything for next year. They said they did. Yeah, that was incorrect. I'm Amy McCrellis. I live at 77 Berlin Street. Until recently, I was the community representative on the Farmers Market Board. And I just want to say that I'm really thrilled, even though I'm not wearing that hat anymore, with how both organizations were able to work together with themselves and each other and the city. I know that in the past, we've had some challenges with that. So I'm really happy, even though I'm not wearing that hat anymore, that it was able to be resolved in a positive way. And I would add that it doesn't sound like a big deal for a market to close early or close for a day, but these are up to 60 people whose livelihoods depend on this market and this community. So thank you, everybody, for coming together in consideration of that. Okay. Thank you. Any further comments? Uh, is there a motion regarding the toy run? I move that we approve the street closure uh, as requested. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, uh, the street closure of Langdon Street for the 3rd of July. Um, so um, I know there's um, some, uh, Mary Alice, I know you wanted to comment on that. Now would be the time if you want to. Um, <laughs> No, it's fine. City Council in a while. It's all good. So I'm Mary Alice with Down Home Kitchen, and I just wanted to say how exciting it is to see so many street closures happening on Langdon. I feel like we've been getting, a, I've been getting a lot of emails from Jamie with more and more people requesting to close Langdon Street, and I think it's fantastic, and I think it benefits the community. And what I'm seeing out of the windows of Down Home is just a lot of diverse people, from kids to older people to people coming in from quite a long way away to enjoy this space. So I'm in full support of this. Um, just had a concern about the design of the Department of Liquor Control um, alcohol barriers for street closures. And I wanted to come tonight to just offer up um, a model that worked really well for us on our first birthday party, before we had our parklet out, we actually um, had a street closure to celebrate and have a dinner for Down Home's first birthday party. This was in uh, 2016. And with the, uh, in the spirit of bringing business into the neighboring businesses on Langdon, 
we did not rope off or close off any um, of the sidewalks on Langdon Street. We kept our alcohol barrier in the roped off area inside the street so that traffic could flow from one side of Langdon down to the other. With the exception of down home sidewalk, um, you could walk, you know, past down home on the corner and turn and you could go, you know, to the Onion River Sports, you could go to the record store, but our, our barrier was basically set up in a way so that it drew people down the street, and many people did not come to our birthday party, but they ended up going and buying something. Um, let's say they were going to Jay Langdon, or she wasn't open at the time, but go into, you know, Onion River Sports. So I think design is really critical with special events, and um, what I would like to just kind of request is that city council or whoever's overseeing um, this can keep in mind that if we can keep our alcohol barriers um, like a, some kind of consciousness around the way that they're designed then not only the people coming to attend that event can enjoy this space but people who might want to come and walk down Langdon and be a part of the feeling of the event while not actually going into an event with alcohol and beer let's say maybe they have kids with them or maybe they're older <coughs> folks who don't drink alcohol they could still come and be a part of the event. So I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And is that, does anyone have any questions? I have a really good design that we drew for that event. I'm happy to send it to the city as an example. Um, and I think it might help everybody. Um, yeah, sound good? Okay. Um, I'm sure you, you might have some thoughts yeah. you'd like Thank to share. You. Thank you. My name is Brad, I'm from uh, Lang Street Tavern. I redrew a map, uh, I guess it wasn't very clear earlier, and I heard we had some problems on the 5th with uh, what happened with Mary Alice and the whole end of the thing. Our, the fencing should not even go at, as far down as uh, close past the parking lot where, where Onion River stops, so it shouldn't be impede on any business, and the only place it is impedes is where our door is, so everybody come in and out of the restaurant with a beverage if they want to in. So welcome to kids and families all the time. So. Cool. Um, and my understanding is that um, uh, the Department of Liquor Control map is not finalized they yet. They don't ask for a map. Okay. Um, so okay. one of the... Well, that, well so, we can talk about that after. Um, that's not what your partners told us. One of, we'll talk about it later. Um, one of the um, proposals that I... Um, that, that may work potentially is if we could say that from the corner of the the um, the outermost corner of the parklet um, to where the um, entryway is if there could be at least uh, 10 feet yeah. uh, if not 15 feet um, that would would that be um, sufficient I, I, I just want to jump in here and say that my my being here tonight is really not just about the parklet or down home if economic development in downtown Montpelier is going to happen and we're going to do special events and go to the trouble to do many events that don't really make a lot of money, um, the idea is to get people in the habit of coming downtown. And so my point is really around um, creating some kind of design that you guys feel comfortable with, maybe Montpelier Alive collaborates with, downtown business owners collaborate with, so that when you have an event, it's actually a draw into business as, as well as whoever's hosting the event. Because right now, like Juliana with Jay Langdon, she often stays open, she'll stay open late for like arts walk and other things. And she'll do some business in the evenings with folks that have to work during the day that wouldn't otherwise be able to shop. What we want to do is if we have an event on Langdon where we're closing that off, have businesses, not just down home kitchen, not just the park, but be able to stay open late and capture some business that they wouldn't ordinarily do. So I think the idea of having the alcohol there and having an event is a draw, but let's make sure that we're not, um, that, that we're also helping the businesses that are right there on the block as well. So, I mean, what you're saying is great, but the idea is to keep the alcohol barriers in the street, not blocking the sidewalks, um, if that makes sense. O obviously, with your own business, it's different, but mm -hmm. does, is that clarifying at all? Um, um, yes. Um, I just wanna, go ahead, Ashley. I just, I think it, that's what the addendum hand-drawn map is. Right? You, the I Department right? of Liquor Control requires a map that has to get approved when you're serving alcohol on the street. Mm -hmm. They might have overlooked that when you guys did your Arts Fest event, 
but that's pretty standard protocol. I've always had to submit one, and they have to come and walk it with you and approve the barriers of where people are going to be walking with alcohol outside. So, and yeah. so that map that we have, I it's hand. I think it's a street that's party, yeah. but and it, and it, I just want to make sure that. So I don't think folks who are here have access to this, but it's basically it. Yeah. It yeah. is in the middle, right? Yeah, if it's in the middle. The only place it's buried is by our door. But and that's the only place that we can actually stop. They need sidewalk and sidewalk traffic to go down this way. And the only place that people come in and outside the restaurant with the beverage they want. Can, would you mind just like saying that to the mic so that everyone can <laughs> hear you? If that's okay. That's okay. Uh, uh, yeah, the only place, yeah, both sidewalks are open other than right in front of our the restaurant. So people come in and out of the restaurant with the bathroom or whatever they need to with the beverage they want to and food and everything. But both sidewalks are open other than the point where our restaurant is. So. And that's what the fencing is. I didn't really clearly go down as far as down the street as I usually do. And I won't be going as far down as last time for the, the, the 5th of June. So. so for now, that's acceptable? I would just, yeah. Oh. Yeah. yeah. OK. Well, and I, I mean, it would be. Um, um, well, and to be clear, the, yeah, the staff put a condition on the recommendation for street closure that all there be access to all the businesses. Yeah, that's and always, all that's always supposed to yeah. be. So, okay. including the window. I've never okay. had any place of traffic on the sidewalks. Okay. Okay. So, uh, yes, Connor. I'll make a motion to approve the request from Langdon Street Tavern for the street design and the street closure. Second. Further discussion? Do you have something you want to add, Stephen? Yeah, I, on June 10th, I sent a, uh, Steve Whitaker, I sent a, uh, Bill a photo from May, uh, the Montpelier or Mayfest, whatever it was called, Langley Street closure, where a whole section of sidewalk was posted as closed, and I, w I thought that that might have been <coughs> unintended, uh, or at least not even approved, and I don't know what, I don't hear that being discussed. I don't hear that being prevented from happening again. I was told by the city manager that it wasn't supposed to happen, but yet it happened, and I sent a photo of it. I don't know if it was circulated to the council, but I'm hoping we're not uh, overlooking that kind of, we have a problem even with the existing, uh, in various places in town, of congestion between a bike park and a hostess table and you know, we, we create congestion that's beyond what was intended when permits to use the sidewalk were issued. And that needs to be addressed and, and supervised and, and I don't want to use the word policed, but uh, managed. Uh, it can't be a free for all for whoever wants to close what section when. Thank you for bringing it up. I would appreciate it if Bill would address whether or not. Well, we got the happen. picture, and it clearly was something that wasn't, you know, we it didn't happen in the, the June event, and it's not part of the permit for this closure. If, you know, okay, so it's prohibited from doing You can't that. just block yeah. off a public sidewalk. It's not your property. Okay. So. Um, that was my point. Right. All right. Ashley. Just a quick question. If there, I'm assuming there's probably a law enforcement presence as well if alcohol is, right. is being served. Um, and so I assume if there were any issues, it would be law enforcement who would sort of move mm -hmm. folks along. Okay. Cool. Great question. Uh, okay. Uh, there's been a motion and a second. I think there was seconded. Uh, further discussion? Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. So the motion passes. Um, all right. So we are going to move on to uh, an appointment to uh, the uh, ADA Advisory Committee. Um, so there is um, one uh, applicant for one seat. I don't know if uh, Linda Lyles is here, but if you are, um, we'd love to meet you. Okay. Um, so one, oh, hey, Tom. I'm on, uh, Tom McCarroll with Public Works, and I serve on the ADA Advisory Committee. And I understand that she was unable to make it this evening, so but she does wish to be appointed, so I encourage that to be approved. Great, thank you. Thank you. Jack. Pursuant to 1 VSA Section 313A3, I move that we go into executive discussion, session to discuss the appointment of a public officer. Was there a second? Uh, okay, further discussion? 
All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. We <laughs> should do it. It's probably just good practice. All right, we'll be right back. Okay, is there a motion to come out of the executive session? So moved. So, second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Uh, so at this point, I would move that we appoint Linda Lyles to the uh, Montpelier ADA Advisory Committee. Second. Further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank you, Linda, uh, for your time on this committee. All right. So we are on to um, the Berlin Street uh, speed limit discussion. This is the second public hearing. Uh, so I'm going to officially open the public hearing. Uh, we did uh, get some information from um, our lawyers as to whether or not we could um, Make a speed or establish a speed limit that was lower uh, than um, than the recommended report. But maybe I will let Tom explain that <laughs> or uh, update us as to where we are. Uh, thanks, uh, Tom McArdle from the Public Works Office. Um, I want to first start by saying uh, making a point of clarification. Uh, we're referring to in the ordinance. Uh, under Article 10, Section 300H is Berlin Street. Um, in that section, it references um, Berlin Street is 35 miles an hour from Northfield Street to the town line. I want to clarify that in the report, it states that this study and this recommendation refers to Berlin Street from Granite Street or the River Street intersection to the town line. So it does not refer to that. So I want to make sure that distinction is clear. Um, so I did provide a uh, follow-up uh, memorandum um, in response to questions and concerns that were raised at the last hearing about setting speed limits, um, the council discretion, um, as, as the mayor um, referenced, uh, city uh, attorney opinion, um, pedestrian and bicycle uh, volumes, what that meant in our report, advanced signage and physical alterations as well as this, the questions asked about sidewalks. Um, I won't go into the detail of that. Um, if there's any questions um, from council about that follow-up information or any additional questions in general. Go ahead, Ashley. I would, I would just weigh in. I, I have actually litigated this issue um, <clears throat> myself a few years ago and uh, did not prevail. In so what way? In, in terms of the, my position in litigation was because that was what yeah, it, that was what was adopted in essence by the the governing body and um, there were a few other things certified copies and things like that but uh, it is indeed true if someone does challenge it it has to be enacted in compliance with um, both state law as well as like the manual and uniform traffic control devices and and all of those things so it, it is definitely something that that does get litigated when mm -hmm. it comes up. So, mm -hmm. um, other questions or comments from the council? Um, I'm going to go Don well, first. I just would like to reassure the residents and everyone else that even if we legally have to post at 30, there are still many steps we can do to reduce the speed with traffic coming. And we also can take a very positive step and look at the whole city, citywide, mm -hmm. and try to make it slow down and join Montpelier kind of campaign. So I think this is an opportunity. Don't feel discouraged. Uh, Ashley. So I, um, I've had a little bit more time in my mornings recently. And um, so I've been thinking a lot about this. I've received a huge number of emails, which is great. And I love that people are so active and so engaged in our district. Um, and uh, so I've been doing a lot of thinking about this. And uh, as I was coming up the hill this morning, there is a crosswalk sort of at the, at the crest of that sort of first hill. And doing 35 miles an hour, I've been to crashes where there are bodies in the streets. Uh, it's the most horrifying thing I, I have ever seen. And so um, I felt really strongly sort of after reflecting on this and, and listening to um, everyone's thoughtful commentary, that uh, 
I would actually support going uh, to 25 miles per hour for the first part of the hill. Uh, and then at the second sign where it says, again, 35 miles per hour, changing that to a 30 mile per hour zone that then transitions into the 35, uh, up, it would be at the top of that hill before the uh, water plant, I think, is where it changes to 40. Is that right? Yeah, but that's where we Right, so but it would be 35 through Montpelier, and then it would go to 40 in Berlin. So the, um, perhaps Chief Fakus knows what the second sign is that you're referring to, but the first crosswalk is uh, just before you reach Cedar Hill Lane, um, just shy of that, a couple of house lots prior to that. It is considered a mid-block crosswalk. The second location, I'm not clear on What's where the second the speed limit is. Street? You you referenced a speed I, limit sign. Yeah. Was there another? Is, so, is Wilson Street the landmark? I believe so. Oh. Yeah. It, it was the second 35 mile per hour speed limit sign. So it was after that crosswalk. After the second one. Yeah. Correct. So that the second crosswalk is at Wilson Street. Yes. Okay. So what I would the way I picture this happening at least for now is that if there are clarifying questions the council want to ask um, we can do that now and then I'd love to hear from the public and then we might may go back to some further council discussion if that's all right but for now um, clarifying questions yes did we open the public hearing we did excellent <laughs> <laughs> uh, Glenn um, I don't know if Tony or Tom is ready to respond to this, but I'm curious because Ashley's suggestion of a split speed limit for that stretch of Berlin Street is the first I've considered that idea. Do you have any opinions about uh, having two different speed limits or even three, 25, 30, and 35 on that stretch of Berlin Street in Montpelier? It's something I have not thought of either, but I think it could be very problematic uh, as far as people aren't seeing specific changes in, in landscape traffic patterns or anything else. Uh, if they're on a straight road, uh, no major roads are intersecting or businesses off of that. So, or like a school zone, for example, where you can have a specific, uh, you know, identifying warning warning zone, if you will. So it, that would be a challenge, uh, I think, for, for just general motorists and. One of the things that always concerns us from an enforcement standpoint, we have to be on solid ground because, uh, as we saw many, many years ago, it, it took a, a, a Herculean effort on Main Street Hill to really change driver behavior, a lot of education, a lot of, and a lot of enforcement. Um, again, we just have to be on solid ground because if we're not able to do that to for this, no matter what, 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 you know, even that 30 miles an hour, it's going to be a significant um, effort on our part to make sure we're educating and, and changing driver behavior and that's our ultimate goal so um, that's my one concern that we just have to make sure that it's going to be valid so if a ticket is issued it will it has to hold up in court otherwise we will not be issuing those tickets because um, it puts us in a, in a liable situation so I'll just add to that uh, is the um, the the results of the study indicate that the entire study area be 30 miles an hour, um, but going beyond that um, to, to assist in, in achieving voluntary compliance, which I think is really what our ultimate objective is, um, that most people are law-abiding, um, is, is how we actually accomplish that with signage. Um, it would drop going uphill from 35 to the 25 zone. Uh, presumably at the intersection, so there's an advance sign needed there um, because it's 10 miles or greater change in speed limit, so that's a speed reduction sign. I think that's a difficult message to convey on an already sign-heavy area um, and congested street. Um, for the going for um, eastbound, uh, uphill, um, in the opposite direction, I think it's a, a little more um, readily achievable to give proper notice that the speed limit is is reducing but again the the study indicates that the the, the corridor should be 30 miles an hour um, and I think the more confusion we introduce um, lack of clarity lack of certainty and predictability I think it's less likely you're gonna have voluntary compliance with our limits 
Other questions or comments? Connor. Oh. I, I think where I'm at is I'm uncomfortable passing something that there's not clarity whether we can enforce it or not. I think moving to 30 miles an hour is a step in the right direction. And like Donna, I'd be, um, I think, very eager to look at a more comprehensive approach citywide, maybe moving to 25 miles an hour. But at this point, I'm not sure we're ready for prime time, but I think we do our due diligence and actually look into this, get all the information we need to make an intelligent decision. Um, Glenn. Yeah, just uh, following up, um, I'll say for myself, I, I agree. I think it's a good idea for now to lower it to 30 and to work on traffic calming measures on Berlin Street. Um, I'd be curious to hear a little bit more about, uh, just, just since we're talking about it now, uh, what specific traffic calming measures might work there off the top of your head. Um, I walked up there this morning to be fresh tonight, uh, and it does seem like a, a wide, straight street uh, that, that could potentially be narrower uh, without uh, keeping anyone from driving on it, and that might slow people down somewhat. I also wonder about shifting the, the crosswalks uh, a little bit from, from where they are. It felt to me a little bit like sometimes the crest of the hill blocked some sight lines from the point where you're trying to cross. Um, I don't know if that's everyone's experience or not. But in any case, any, any ideas about, specific ideas about what traffic calming measures could work on Berlin Street? Um, the traffic calming philosophy and, and approach uh, includes a number of different strategies um, that are designed specifically custom fit to the street so there are a lot of lot of tools in the toolbox so to speak um, the committee that Donna sits on is uh, looking at that um, um, for a number of streets um, so I'm sure they'll be looking at this but there I referenced in the report um, and I think is a very good example on a road way like this is uh, uh, Danville uh, route 2 passing through Danville which has a gateway treatment it really makes it very clear that you're entering a town, a village setting, it has a center island and some ornate posts on the side, some lighting, um, welcome signs, and then as you travel through there is some different pavement textures and neck downs, um, so, uh, and again some more center median islands, so that's, that's the approach on a state highway facility and it's appropriate for that setting, there's no speed bumps or tables, um, and that's not really necessary to accomplish um, an effective speed limit that is a 24-7 um, type of uh, uh, impact on, on <coughs> driver behavior. It doesn't, doesn't require aggressive police enforcement. It just, it's there. It really extends the message. And again, you see 85% of the drivers are better uh, accomplishing that. So there's a lot of things that can be looked at um, for that. It doesn't have to be that aggressive to, to really achieve what you're trying to target. And you, you set a target speed limit when you're doing that, um, that you're trying to accomplish. And this is the last thing. Uh, I'm really happy to see so many people out and talking about this and, and at the first public hearing as well. Uh, I'm really pleased to see that level of engagement, and I hope it continues. Um, and in that spirit, I got uh, many emails, as Ashley did, and also a phone message from George Johnson, who I think is not here tonight, a uh, resident of Berlin Street, who wanted me to pass on to the council his uh, strong opinion that we should lower the speed limit to 25. Uh, and I wanted to lay that out before council should shut up. Thank you. Other clarifying questions from council? Lauren. Um, so I am also at kind of in a similar place, it sounds like, of, you know, and I'm very interested to hear what people have to say and so appreciate the engagement. Um, we've got a lot of messages too, which is great. Um, looking at the kind of legal opinions of how you would need to deviate from the traffic study, it looks like it, it references things like local knowledge of pedestrian and bike traffic, road conditions, sight lines, children in the area, and so on. And I guess I'm just curious, 
you know, what's not included in the traffic study? Like, is there a case that could be made, you think, based on the information we've gathered from the public that we could be legally defensible to go um, below? Or do you feel like that was all pretty well captured in what you've done, so it would be hard to stand on two legs um, in court to defend the, the 25, even though um, people might understandably want a lower speed limit. I've got young children. I'm very sympathetic to wanting, you know, slow traffic, um, but just curious on that point. Uh, it's an excellent question. Uh, the the uh, reason why uh, Attorney McLean um, mentioned that is um, all of those things that are included in that um, report, um, it's whether or not you, the city council, through your testimony and your own judgment and opinion, feel that there was not enough emphasis given to any one or more factor that uh, should be um, expanded upon and be given greater weight, um, that he recommends that you, uh, if you do that, uh, that you make it very clear um, that you disagree or wish to expand on that point um, and that it's properly documented. So if there is a challenge, um, you cite the report and then you cite why you would deviate um, from it um, for whatever reason. I would just also, I was just uh, doing a little bit of research, and there is a significant difference in the, uh, so the other morning I saw uh, a young family with a, an infant in a baby carriage crossing uh, that first, uh, not the one at the bottom of the hill, but the second one if you're headed up. Um, and, you know, the way that the sun was, I saw her because I was solely focused on that, but there's a significant difference between striking a pedestrian at 25 miles per hour and a pedestrian at 30 miles per hour. I mean, they're both going to be dangerous no matter what, but... Uh, <laughs> I just, um, you know, I, I live on East State, and I think the speed limit is uh, it's 35, and then it goes down, or it's 30 on college, and then 30 coming down, but... You're going downhill. It's all 25. 25. Um, but people fly through there at like 30 or 35 miles an hour, like on the reg. And as somebody who like uses that crosswalk right there, that's you know at the at the bottom of, of a bit of a hill, and then sort of heads down the next one. It's really scary when you're trying to cross the street. And I appreciate that, you know, it's it's not a, a common occurrence that pedestrians get struck, but it does happen. And uh, speed limits and traffic calming, I think I think it's, it has to be a combination of both. Um, but I would just, I would really like us to explore the, the gradual increase up to Berlin. Any other clarifying questions? Yeah, come down. Well, I, I don't think setting the speed will change the habits. Mm -hmm. And especially if there's multi-speed in one strip. And, and the argument, if I got a ticket in some other community, I'd probably fight it and say, no, I was this inches back where the other speed was, or I was confused by the signs. So I feel at this time what we can do, Tom's put it through all the analysis that we're allowed, and he's a very dependable expert. That he's come to 30 miles an hour. I feel we should go there, and we should then really work on all the traffic calming elements, community education, and get the rest of the community to support just being slower. We can also put flashing beacons on the crosswalks. So there are lots of things we can do, and I would rather do that. So I would make a motion that we, you don't want a motion, okay? No, no uh, sorry. I also definitely want to hear from the public. So. Oh, yes, okay. Yes. <laughs> sorry, I've been yes. sitting here definitely. for a while. Yes, yes, yes. I oh, hey, But hang on, um, are there any other clarifying questions from the council? Okay, so now is the opportunity. Um, if you have comments uh, about this, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and again, try to keep your comments to two minutes or so. All right, go ahead. Uh, the jumping to conclusions before you've heard the public comment in the hearing is, is troubling. Uh, it, it's not the first time it's happened. Uh, the, one of your options, I think, is to table this, to not take action on it, and to develop the clear rationale. It says in the memo that Tom provided that as comprehensively on the record, clearly and comprehensively as possible, the reasons that it's deviating from the recommended speed, including all the local influencing factors, such as knowledge of pedestrian and bike traffic, road conditions, strollers, 
elderly and firm, some population research, etc. There, it will be more confusing to drag this into a two-step, 30 now, 25 later, <coughs> with infinite delay, possible construction. It would be much more considerate of the residents uh, and consistent to the non-familiar public to set it down to 25 as soon as you could develop these rationale. I think that would take some time with the lawyer and with the report that Tom already prepared and with the testimony that you're about to hear and heard last meeting. But you can set forth a clear rationale as detailed as necessary to defend a 25 speed limit and set it. But don't waver on this. Don't, you know, make these residents wait, you know, another year of fighting this, you know, mercurial process to get a safe speed limit for a residential neighborhood. It was never intended as a shortcut, fast shortcut to the hospital. Yeah. Thank you. Vicki Lane in Montpelier. Um, I just have a couple of things. Um, I would like to request that this include the entirety of Berlin Street. Um, I know it starts at Granite Street, but um, the other part of Berlin Street is just as deserving and is a lot more pedestrian than, than we are. Um, and I know in the days when I was able to walk downtown, I was scared to death to walk on that section of Berlin Street. I would take Stonecutter's Way because it was safer. Because people, especially in the, at night, drive so fast and there's not, at least at that time, the sidewalks were almost level with the road, so it was, it was scary. Um, but I would like to request that the entirety of Berlin Street be considered. Um, and, and I really would like 25. And I know when Barry changed the speed limit on 302, from 40 to 25 in that section. Um, and I think now, after however many years it is, people are educated to that now. Um, I think a few substantial tickets took care of that issue. Um, and if they get behind me, they'll understand. Thank you. Hi. Hi. How are you guys? Good, how are you? Jean Leon. Um, I'm not going to repeat what I said last time, but yeah, I agree. It should, the neighborhood should be split, gradual, half, 25, then 30, then 35. The same amount of families that are downhill are up the hill, and kids and children. I wish the postal workers that do that yeah. area yeah. were here. They yeah. wanted to come, but they have that concern. They all say it should be 25. Crossing the street is a problem. So factors in, in the research, and all the data collected, I think the most important factor is residents and the voices of the people, the citizens of this town, and also comparables. So when you're going on State, Northfield Street again, Main Street, now when you're going on State Street towards the Creamy Stand, there's a neighborhood there, and it's 25 miles per hour that the council at one point voted for, or, oh. well, to my Anyway, somehow that neighborhood got changed to 25 once you get into those few homes there on State Street by the Dairy Creamy. So, also, so that's an important part of any study, is having comparables from not only other streets, but neighborhoods, cities, towns, other states, when you're on Worcester going towards Elmore into Morrisville, and this we don't have, this is the capital. As soon as you're getting to Morrisville, down this hill, welcome to Morrisville, first sign. Second sign, reduce speed ahead. Third sign, 25 miles per hour up ahead. Fourth sign, 25 miles per hour with a meter <coughs> that says your speed. So that is a way, also enforcement, will break habits after a while. People will know, people will come to know, there'll be posted, there'll be signs, there'll be lights. I also conducted my own study and my own time. And I'm 
probably the busiest guy you've ever met um, with a radar gun, which shows a conclusive report on the speed on a one week study on a two year period. Um, yes, 85% are speeding, 85%. So I'd like to present this to the council. It's all dated, times, uphill, downhill, AM, PM, and on the dates. And you will find the average speeds are 40, some are 50. And this is based on the first 20 vehicles. So I go up with the radar gun, it's a velocity speed gun, and I spend the money to purchase and do this. And you can pass it around, present it into evidence. You know, it's not a court of love. It's, it's, it's just, um, like you were saying, it's just a, another factor that has to be considered into legal, to however this could get resolved to 25. And all these... Just so you know, you're over to... to yeah, yeah. Factor, all these agendas and all these issues are all important. But this is something that we have to live with every day, 365 days a year. So it's an urgent matter. And, and I think it, you know, it has to be addressed right away. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi. Okay. My name is Roberta Garland, and I live at 10 Wilson Street, right by the second crosswalk. Um, I was very happy to hear that there's a proposal to lower the speed limit to 25 miles an hour. I think if it goes to 30, people are still going to go fast. My daughter, um, well, the second, those crosswalks are located that way, and the, so the bus stop stops, the school bus stop stops right on the other side, of, right on the other side of the road. So kids cross the street in the crosswalks, and they get on the school bus. Unfortunately, cars don't stop for those kids crossing the street. My daughter spent two years crossing that street, and um, sometimes I would go out there and stand and wave my arms in front of the cars to, ha to tell them they had to stop. They didn't stop. I called the police. I said, can you put a cruiser up there? They said, yeah, we can do it. You know, some of the time we did some of the time. I, they said I could take the, to write down the license plates and give them the license plates, so I did that some of the time, but you can't do that every day. It was really disturbing. It was really scary. I think that um, going up that hill, people, people gain some speed. You know, they start up and then they gain some speed, and at that second crosswalk, they're not going to stop because they've gotten their speed. So I think going down to 30 is still going to want that speed going up that hill. Okay. Um, I also bike a lot on that hill, and it's, it's really um, nerve-wracking to bike with cars going up and down. I would, I really like that idea of narrowing Berlin Street and making a real good bike path on the side so Montpelier expands their bicycle-friendly sense. I like that. I think that would, look, would slow people down, too. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Just in time, we're at 305 Berlin Street. So, um, I mean, I gotta be honest, living on Berlin Street doesn't make me want to live in Montpelier. It gets really unsafe. I mean, I'm like, I am worried about um, snow blowing. Um, I don't know what I'm gonna do when the kids have to go to school because we're on the uphill side, so we're gonna have to cross the street probably every morning. Um, he goes to school on Sherwood. We can get to Sherwood to his school, but we have to like walk on people's lawns and stuff. Um, it's a really scary place to live. And I think that um, a 25 mile an hour speed limit should be the whole street. I kind of feel like where we are is almost like second class up there past where the sidewalk ends a little bit. Um, and it's kind of sad. Um, uh, I don't know. I mean, that, that's how I kind of feel. Sorry. I've been back there yelling the whole time, too. Um, well, I don't think I have a lot else. I mean, that's just how it kind of feels like. It just feels very unsafe. Um, and uh, I'm worried about the kids and how they're going to get across the street to the school bus. And it'd be nice if we had a little bit more sidewalk, not necessarily sidewalk, but some shoulder 
And I really, really strongly disagree that um, we can do voluntary, um, like voluntary training. There's too much commuter traffic on that street and people are just gonna continue to go fast if it's not really enforced similar to how it is coming into, say, Morrisville, how somebody mentioned. When you come into Morrisville, you know it's 25 when you're coming into town. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Yep. Hello. Thank you. My name is Nate Fredericks, and I live across from Justin, who just spoke. Um, living at the top of the hill is a dangerous place to live. Um, people are coming off of the highway called Pink Turnpike going 50 miles an hour sometimes right into Montpelier even though the speed limit is 35. Um, there's also a uh, curve there right at Sherwood and people coming from the other direction into Berlin are starting to speed up as the uh, density of homes um, and uh, I'm not sure why exactly, but I, I've noticed that I've lived there um, in this uh, street area now for uh, over 10 years, and um, maybe it's just me. Uh, it does seem like uh, people, there's more traffic. I know that for sure, um, and uh, I'm pretty sure people are going faster than they used to be. Um, not, I have no idea why, but um, so two points or three points in addition I'd like to make. Um, what are the speed limit? What is the speed limit on Route 12 coming in on Elm Street? On Elm Street, 25, and that's a that's a state highway. When you say it's 35. Well, when you say coming in, it's 40 initially. It's 40, but it goes initially. down to 25 it, when it hits. Yes. yes. At the Cumming village. Street, it, yeah. it goes from a 30 to a 40 in around Cumming Street area, and then it drops down to 25. I mean, 25. Sorry. Yeah. At Cumming sorry. Street. Yeah. And what is the speed limit on? Um, uh, where the middle school is going up. What street is that again? Main, Main, Main street. street. Thank you. Sorry. 25. 25. 25. Okay. <coughs> and the speed limit is also a 25 heading out from Montpelier towards um, Middlesex, at least for a portion where there's housing up, up until the cemetery, correct? Correct. Okay. I just wanted to make that all clear to everyone on this. Um, yeah, I just looked at State Street. It's 201 State is the, is the change there. Yeah. So my point is 25 seems perfectly reasonable. Um, people, again, are going very fast at the top of that hill near Sherwood. There is a lot of young families, including mine, Justin's who just spoke, um, several other neighbors. Um, it's excessive. It's dangerous. There's no sidewalk. Um, and uh, uh, just, I don't think I have anything else to add. I just wanted to just bear with me one second. Times up. Yeah, again, people are flying off of uh, paint turns like in Berlin. Thank you. Sorry, I got so involved in time. We've got a lot of extra time. I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> I was listening carefully. Uh, my name is Cadence Richardson. This is my husband, Ken. And we live on the second crest of Berlin Street um, on the side that doesn't have a sidewalk. And just as residents who like to go and walk down the sidewalk to get to downtown Montpelier and need to cross the street to get to the sidewalk, period. Um, we are both in support of 25 miles per hour just because, like people have said, people are definitely abusing the speed limit. And even if it was 25, people are going to go faster than that anyway. So, yeah, I, I would just like to support having 25 miles an hour be the speed limit for the entire stretch um, because people really do speed up quickly and, um, you know, there's, people have lawns with a lot of steep banks. They're mowing their lawns in the spring and summertime. Come winter, people are snow blowing, shoveling. The road gets, um, you know, really slick and cars are going and doing weird things. Um, uh, I, I meant to thank the police too because I have noticed the police more on the street lately. Um, they did have sort of a speedometer thing on the street for a while, which I thought was helpful. Um, so maybe that's an idea to bring something like that back. Thank you. And could you just say your name for the record? Oh, uh, sorry. My name is Ken Fritchipson. Okay. Thanks. Um, I'm 
Julie Giffen, and I live at 222 Ruin Street, which is just, a, just above Wilson Street, which is where Ashley was um, suggesting that the speed limit increase. And um, I've lived on Berlin Street, my, me and my family have lived on Berlin Street for 52 years now. So we had the luxury of living on there when it was, a, when it was narrow before it was widened. And I, and I don't know what the speed limit was then. I don't, I don't remember, but I imagine it was probably 25 miles an hour. Um, I don't know. And I haven't read your report. I apologize for that. So I don't have all the facts that you've put into this. But I can say that living on Berlin Street in the wintertime is a little bit of a nightmare. If you, if you are able to pull out of your driveway going frontwards, you're lucky. Chan chances are good you can't. You have, to, you, you have to drive in straight on because there's so much traffic on the street. There's no way you could hold the traffic to back in. Um, the snow banks get so high that you can't really see, see out. If you have any ice on your driveway, my driveway happens to be on a hill, so if you have to, you know, you need a little extra time because you're gonna spin your wheels before you get onto the road, you're probably not gonna make it because the cars are going down the road. Um, I've seen uh, the bus stops. I don't understand actually how the bus stops work. It used to be that they would just be, I hate to good old day, you guys, but it used to be that it was right next to our house and all the, all the kids from, you know, from Wilson Street to Phelps Street would uh, would come and, and that would be the bus stop. And now it seems like every place that there's like a kid, the, the bus will stop. And that slows traffic down as well, with people trying to like commute to work. Um, and I just feel like 25 miles an hour is reasonable for the dense, for the residential density of that, of that area. The, the, um, the safety, I've had at least two cars on my front lawn um, that have it had act, as some sort of accident. Um, it's. It, I never let my kids play in the front yard, and I thought I was being overprotective until, until they took out a tree. Um, so, I just. Feel, I feel like 25 miles an hour is a reasonable thing. The road noise would be much less. I think that the flashing beacon is not a great idea actually because it, they, they'd just be flashing in people's room houses. You know, night. You know, whenever they'd go off, people would be like, you know, getting all the flashes coming in. I don't like that idea. I like it downtown. It works really well, but not in a residential area. I don't think that's appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. I also find that even if, even if, even if, even if one car stops at a crosswalk, and I don't think people really think of those crosswalks on Berlin Street as being anything to pay attention to, the car behind it might not. And I feel like there's probably plenty of um, close calls as far as rear ending goes, if not pedestrian. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'd also like to um, remind the council that we have a tremendous amount of commercial traffic on that street now. Um, 25 years ago when I moved it there, there wasn't that much commercial traffic. And the commercial traffic doesn't always obey the speed limit either. Um, even the city trucks don't always obey the speed limit. Um, or the police cars when they when they don't have their lights on. Um, I live on the corner of Phelps, and so when I'm trying to get into my driveway on the downhill side, I gotta really check that mirror um, because if I put my blinkers on, people think I'm going to go to Phelps, and they just you know they go around me regardless of whether there's another car coming, and so it's difficult to get into the driveway. Um, but I have to really check in the mirror for somebody coming down so fast that they're going to rear-end me. I was rear-ended once. Um, and coming up the hill is the same thing. They're going to, you know, they're gaining their speed to go up that hill. And they don't check the directional signal lights on the, on the thing. But we do have a tremendous amount more traffic than, uh, than we used to have. And, um, as far as the school buses, we're kind of lucky. When I was a kid, um, school buses stopped at every <coughs> single residence. You did not leave your kid, leave a kid on the other side of the street or at some else other residence. Thank you. Hi, I'm Deborah Lisman, and I live on Upper Pleasant View Street, which is parallel to Berlin, and. Um, I have walked downtown before and back, and it is really scary to cross at the crosswalk, so, and I totally want the kids to be safe. Um, and I have one little concern about the speed limit 
in the opposite side of things, which is I drive a Prius, which is a little car, and I have studded snow tires, and in the winter, I actually have a hard time getting up the hill, and that's the least steep hill to get to my home, and that's at 30 or 35 miles an hour. If it's lower, I'm not sure if I can get up the hill. So I'm kind of like, uh, I don't know what to do. I can get another car, I can get a bigger car or something, but I'd like to not do that. But I also want the kids to be safe, and adults too, because it is, even as an adult, it is scary, so I get it, like, if you're a pedestrian. Thank you. Hello, I'm Laura Smith Riva. I live at 286 Berlin Street, the big white farmhouse at the top of the hill where the, where the sidewalk ends, where the sheep are. Um, and I, I stand with my neighbors about um, dropping the speed limit to 25. I did, um, I did write to my representative, and I, I think Tom was included on that uh, memo, the uh, flashing uh, speed limit that says your speed is this was placed after the last public hearing was placed on my property on the street sign on my property so I was able to kind of watch it and I was kind of keeping an eye on it every day and it did seem like at least during the times I saw it that it had the effect of of people going slower in fact less than 35 so that was pleasing to me I did notice that the traffic coming up Berlin Street and heading towards Berlin was going considerably faster, probably because there was no calming uh, mechanism there uh, at, at that spot. And so, you know, I, I read the report and I, I understand the study and I also understand that we have to, um, you know, we have to do it in such a way that if there was a speeding, if a speeding ticket was issued that it can be enforced. And I have never seen enforcement on the street, so I have no idea how much of that happens. So I'm not sure what the right answer is, but I, stand, I do stand with my neighbors uh, on the 25. I, I really think that if every other approach into the city, or most of them, drops the 25 at a residential area, I don't understand why the city council would not be able to use its authority to recognize that and, and do what needs to be done to make sure that, God forbid, we aren't standing here in a year from now uh, wondering why we didn't do it after somebody has been hit. I had my, uh, I've got my ATV for sale right now. It's parked on the street. A guy stopped today, I was talking to him about it, and then another guy stopped and, and pulled off to the curb right there by my house, and it was, my dogs went running over, and it was really terrifying because traffic came, you know, wailing up behind him, and then there's other traffic oncoming, um, and it isn't, there is no parking there on the street, I don't think, but you know, people want to be able to have yard sales. They want to be able to like walk outside their house. They want to be able to have, you know, an opportunity to um, be neighborly and it's really hard to do with that traffic. I also witnessed my uh, neighbors ac across the road. I don't know if they're here, but they have landscapers who come and do their yard and they had two big trucks with trailers and they parked them on Berlin Street with the orange cones and there was almost like three accidents as I just stood there watching it because it's right on the hill and people are, the commuter traffic is, is, doesn't give a damn about anybody who's on that street. They just want to get through quickly to downtown Montpelier to their jobs or whatever. And, and I really think it's the commuter traffic that, that is the problem. The people who live in that area are not the ones speeding for the most part. Uh, I always have to watch my speed. <laughs> But, you know, it's that commuter traffic, and they don't care that there's something happening on the street for which they maybe should slow down. There was people laying on their horns because these uh, vehicles were there with their landscaping equipment, and, and they were going to have to slow down to let somebody come past so that they could squeeze through. And I could keep going, but I will stop because the red stop <laughs> sign is in front of me. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You actually got three minutes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Matt Dolezal. I live on Berlin Street. Um, I just wanted to bring up the issue that perhaps in 1991, this might have been a, a good idea to expand the road and perhaps increase the speed limit a little bit. But in this day and age, we have people with much more distracted driving. And particularly when it's a residential area like this, the smallest distraction obviously could, could result in a terrible accident. I think that if, if people are forced to drive at 25, and <coughs> they do drive distra distractedly, then at least that'll be a, a lower impact 
if there is an accident. That's all I really have to say. Okay. Thank you. Good evening. Um, my name is Perry Scartosi. I live at 273 Berlin Street, which is up towards the top of the hill um, across from the, the white farmhouse with the sheep. I'll start off by saying that was probably my lawn equipment that was walking out of the so, um, I have to come clean first. But, uh, I'm here as a strong advocate for a 25 mile per hour speed limit on Berlin Street uh, to run the entire length of that street for a couple of different reasons. I'll share a very quick uh, story based on the two minute rule here. Um, I'm new to that street. I lived close to that area off on Pleasant View Street for many years before moving on to Berlin Street. That's a very fast moving traffic on that street. And people are conditioned coming off the paying turnpike, like the gentleman was saying. They want to drive fast. You're on the freeway, right? You're, you're driving 65 there. They get off. They're slowly decrementing in speed. But their mindset is not that of a person ready to drive at city speeds at that point, at least at the top of the hill. So we moved in there roughly four months ago, which meant we had a, a big rental truck being a thrifty person, I rented it. My wife in the back was the person with the cone stopping the traffic, and it was a nightmare. The speed of the cars coming around that, that junction, maybe posted 35, but bear in mind, that's the absolute minimum somebody will drive to not get a ticket, right? So we've got heavy traffic, industrialized traffic, I'd say in some cases. There's a, a UPS, right, with all the e-commerce now, the UPS and the FedEx trucks rule that road. So I would just say that, you know, in places like uh, where I live, up at, higher up on the hill, um, there's added, you know, added um, speeds, there's added traffic, um, and less space actually for us with no sidewalks. My mailbox is 36 inches from that white line, okay? So I am, okay, I'm, I'm less than 36 inches for now, which means I'm taking up that space. So if you do that and you put your arm out, that's where the UPS truck is driving 40 miles per hour to check my mail. So please consider it. Uh, once again, I'm an advocate for a 25 mile per hour speed limit. Thank you. Thank you. And me. I'm Mary Carol Dobbins. I live at 300 Berlin Street uh, near Perry. And I just want to strongly support a change to 25 miles per hour. We know people will go a little more than that. But we need to rein them in some. I have some articles here based on a surprising way slower driving makes better cities. And so it's, um, it's recent, it's, uh, it's appropriate, so if I, I'd like to share that with the council, a couple of those. And a, a, an enormous change from 30 to 25. So, and I would like to add that I believe that the report you're basing your, your um, current consideration on is based on how many pedestrians were, were noted. Well, we don't have pedestrians because it's too scary to walk on the street. So I feel like the initial uh, report is flawed because we don't walk on it because it's not safe. So I promise you, many of us would. I would, and I, many of my neighbors would. And I live at the top of the hill. <laughs> the people fly down that street, and there's limited sight, to, uh, uh, sight uh, view of Hebert and Sherwood coming around the corner, people coming up quickly. It's just, uh, it's, it's untenable to keep it that way, to go down that, that fast. So please consider 25. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Welcome. Noah Sexton. Uh, my wife and I live at 200 Berlin Street, and we're right near the upper crossbar. And uh, only, I've only lived here four years, uh, but I've seen more children, young children moving in, and you see them morning and all coming down. Crosswalk is not painted. You wouldn't even hardly see us there. They have the sign. It was down for four or five days. So they knocked it over and it just laid there. Uh, so I strongly am in favor of 25 mile an hour uh, speed limit. Uh, I do like the idea that Donna came up with. It. Let's, let's make it a welcome to Montpelier. And then the next things, the next thing, where the speed sign is now, the flashing one. It really does. I've noticed a difference since you, after the last meeting, the sign went up there. I've seen a noted difference in the speed of the cars coming out because you're coming down real steeply before you get to the crest of the hill past the growing sign. 
and people are speeding up. And that was just a reminder to do it. I, you're right, most people are going to watch the speed limit, uh, but you can lose sight of them real quick. Uh, and the other thing, factors, Ashley was saying there's a big difference between 35, 30, 25, and you've mentioned something hitting it. Another thing is reaction time. There's a big difference in the reaction time of any driver of 10, 5 to 10 miles an hour difference. So that's another factor that should be taken into. Thank you. Thank you. Um, before we have repeats, if there's anybody else who hasn't spoken yet that would like to. Jean Richardson, 200 Berlin Street. I just want you to know that I live in fear every time I turn into my driveway, whether it's coming up the hill or going down the hill. Mm -hmm. I've seen so many rear end accidents on that hill. And the other just note is that there's a minimum of five UPS trucks a night that buzz up that hill. And I can tell you that because my dog barks at every one of them. So <laughs> There should be a different route for them. The other thing is we have um, semis that apparently their GPS tells them this is the shortest route to some place. And they are prohibited from, theoretically, from going up Berlin Street. We need some better method of enforcing that. Thank you. OK, go ahead. Thanks for pointing that out. The GPS route does route people up Berlin Street and not on 302. Um, so thank you, that's a good point. Um, and I just wanted to, um, if you're gonna have a speed limit uh, radar sign, um, really ideally the best place to put that, in my opinion, is where people are going the fastest, and that's just before Sherwood Drive, if you're headed into Montpelier. Um, again, that's also on a blind curve um, where there's a major intersection. So thank you, that's all, thank I appreciate you. it. Laura Berlin Street, just to follow up on the comment somebody made about the semis. Um, I did witness a semi come up Berlin Street. I contacted the city. I contacted the uh, police. And I contacted, I believe it was the, uh, I think it was Public Works. This was last winter. And each party directed me to somebody else. And I, I don't know that I, and I contacted FedEx, because it was a big FedEx 18-wheeler. I, and I wrote to them. I never heard from anybody. Um, I never heard that that was, shouldn't be happening. I never heard that there was any follow-up. I never heard that there was any enforcement. And I was specifically told by the people I spoke to at the city and at the police, which I think I wrote to them through Facebook, that there was nothing that they, they could do. And, um, and so I'm just putting that out there. If, if it's posted, no the, the gross weight is a certain amount and the trucks are prohibited and trucks are going up there, what are we to do if we call it in and, we're, and there's no um, mechanism for enforcement or even reassurance for the uh, people who, live, who are living in that area? Thank you. Right. Thank you. I'm still waiting for some of the damage to be fixed from the, from the truck trailers. And all you have to do when you go up Berlin Street is look at that big yellow post that they put after the fifth time the, the um, what do they call them, fire thing was uprooted. And look at the scratches on that, and you'll see how many times it's happened. And my house shakes when it happens. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Carol Tilly. My husband and I live at 276 Berlin Street, top of the hill. We have a curve on both sides. We have to cross the street where the first rural delivery. I've almost been hit twice. My husband's almost, and uh, once, my husband's almost been hit twice. We have had people end up on our front lawn. The lady next door had two accidents over the sidewalk on her lawn, and diagonally across from us, somebody almost hit a tree and ended up on the lawn, fair amount up on the lawn. Thank you. Thank you. I just had a question. So based on accidents, there was some, am I right, there was some accident reports on the data, but not, how about how many animal killings in, in that report and, and, and what time frame? 
and, and how many citations were issued in that same time frame of the study. There's, there's no report on that. Like how many days out of the year were, was their enforcement and how many citations were issued? I mean, that's a, another important factor in any type of study. So. Thank you. Any further comments? Okay, uh, Jack. Thank you, I, I'm afraid I have a kind of a long thing to say, but I'll make, I have several points to make. The first thing I wanna say though is that uh, two of the things that I heard the residents <coughs> say, are, I think are very important things that we need to address. If people are passing the school buses, when school buses are stopped, that has to be uh, enforced uh, very severely. That is uh, completely unacceptable. We see videos on YouTube of, uh, of people driving past school buses and uh, if we were to see an accident where a child is hit by a, by a car like that, nobody in, in the city wants to see that. So I think we really, that really needs to be enforced. Similarly, I agree with people who say that we should have sidewalks the full length of, uh, of Berlin Street. It should go up to the top. And uh, I agree. I've, I've walked, uh, I've had to walk up uh, past where the sidewalk ends, and it's, uh, it's concerning. Um, having said that, though, it's, I'm, I'm glad to hear so many people from the neighborhood here to uh, speak their concerns. However, it's important that this is a, a main road, it's not simply a neighborhood road, and it's a road that supports, uh, that serves the entire community, not just the uh, people who live right on that street. I actually lived on Berlin Street for 12 or 13 years, uh, so I know uh, what conditions are like there. Um, in order to, uh, we have the report from the uh, Department of Public Works and Berlin Street is not considered a uh, high accident area. It's rough, considered <coughs> roughly half the accident rate of, uh, of comparable streets. Um, I think we have a very well done uh, traffic study. Um, I do not think we have evidence that would justify varying from the traffic study to support a speed limit lower than 30. Today, on my lunch hour, I uh, decided to take, uh, take a drive up Berlin Street, trying to drive 25 all the way up and all the way down. And it is really not easy to drive 25. It's uh, it's very hard to keep keep it below 25. The uh, the natural the design of the road, everything about the road, uh, signals to the uh, normal driver that uh, the range of 30 to 35 is a reasonable speed for that street, um, up or down. Coming down to go uh, 30 25, you'd have to ride your brakes pretty much the whole way down. So I. Uh, support uh, the proposal to uh, to go to 30 from uh, from Granite Street intersection up to the town uh, city limits. Other thoughts or comments? Are we at motion time? Um, I'm, I mean, maybe we could, but I think I'm suspecting I have, that I have other a question people for staff. Oh, just a, as a note on the evidence that I provided of 20 cars every day that that, that's proof of speed limit. And that's up on the top of the hill where these folks were um, sharing their concerns. Ride the brakes. Yeah. Ride <laughs> the brakes. It's so it's hard to do 25. Um, um, all right. Okay. Uh, Donna, go ahead. I, I wanted to ask uh, both Tom and Tony, if we did go ahead and make Berlin Street 25, how would that be implemented? What would be the impact and how would you suggest we try to do that 
even what, whatever, the speeding tickets and legalities, if we just did that and then move towards more traffic calming elements, but you know, that's going to have to be in road construction. There's cost to most traffic calming. Uh, so that would take a longer time. I'm just saying if we did the 25 posting all the way up and we ed you know, put out marketing, but in-house, what does that amount to for both of you? I go first. First, like I said earlier, <clears throat> if if we know that uh, it is posted illegally, in other words, it does not have the backing for it to be uh -huh. a lo legitimate stop. Okay. If we make one questionable stop, and somebody uh, articulates that, uh, and there's you know, very recent uh, cases happening in Vermont, makes an allegation against the police. You knew this was not a lawful stop, and you know. Uh, it can be very problematic. Um, so uh, a couple of things I just want to add, though, in terms of uh, there's always multiple options when you're trying to deal with traffic. Uh, first and foremost, uh, ideally, the, the end goal is to have safe neighborhoods, safe streets, mm -hmm. and, and really have good driver, uh, responsible driver behavior. On the enforcement side, um, we, we can add uh, the, the problem is, is that you know how we what we have for resources uh, in terms of you know the personnel and, and at what times it's always going to be a roll of the dice because I'm also getting pressure not not here tonight but from other communities other streets that feel they're marginalized in Montpelier because they're not maybe in the core downtown area or or other locations so we're always trying to, to balance that so we need to be uh, clear-eyed in terms of what our resources are uh, we've had internal discussions about having even um, some kind of maybe street uh, uh, highway or road enforcement team and we kind of dedicating officers on that. But is that going to be sustainable? And, you know, can it get us to a point of better, better behavior? But if we target it all on Berlin Street, um, then what other, you know, is, then we're going to have challenges in other parts of the, of the city. Um, what if we did it all? I mean, <laughs> okay. Right. okay. Uh, the I other thing, and one other thing I just want to, I'll just add, uh, there was some confusion at the last meeting about these, the, 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 uh, the temporary uh, radar signs that we, we put up. Um, like some, sometimes, um, you know, they, they say, oh, they're not working. Well, we intentionally, occasionally when we set them up, we set them up not to display, because we're also trying to get raw data. We are trying to track, uh, which does not have the reminder in their face that they're going 37, they need to slow down to 35. Uh, but it's to get, so, so just want everybody to understand that. So sometimes when you see that, it'll just be a blank screen. Um, they, they are collecting data. Yeah. You just don't see it. Yeah. Now so, the secret's out. <laughs> yeah, well, it's... Um, That's all right. Um, it's long day. So, so, and so, and, but it's always, it's always good to hear, too, a, you know, suggestions where we can put those signs. Uh, and we can also use those signs as a, a traffic calming tool. Mm -hmm. um, they certainly help. There's, so anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there because um, from the police perspective, we just want to make sure what we're doing is enforceable, and then we will put every, you know, and, and we will put extra effort. And whenever, as we do it, as we've demonstrated, it, you know, historically, whenever there's a significant change, uh, especially even just something as simple as fresh pavement um, from from a pothole filled road, is going to require a lot more on our effort to to calm calm drivers back down and write, whether we're writing tickets or or um, or stopping cars. So. Can I clarify sure. something? Um, sorry, Tom, if you had something to say, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to follow up on, on Donna's, yeah. um, but I can wait if you'd like. No, no, that's okay. Um, so the, uh, the, the speed re radar um, signs are uh, actually located at existing speed limit signs, so it's where the sign is uh, because the actual speed limit must be displayed with the uh, radar feedback sign, so that's... Uh, so that's why they select those locations. They attach right to the post. Um, and secondly, the data that's collected, um, I'll add to what Chief Fake has said, is it also allows the police department to do uh, more targeted enforcement. So if there are some high rollers that come through at a certain time of day, they can see that because it tracks speed and time of day. Um, so it's it's very helpful data on that side. So I, I think on the, on the um, from overall the, the resident perspectives who live there day in, day out, um, witness, see uh, and how that traffic and speed affects their daily lives. 
I think that's, that's very important, and that's one of the reasons why the conclusions in the study is to, it is the reason, um, and all of those uh, factors considered collectively are, uh, provide the justification to lower it to the 30 miles an hour. Um, I'll read to you or call to your attention the, the speed study that I provided a link um, prepared by VTrans. Um, latest update is 2016. Um, just a cautioning about speed limits, setting speed limits. Um, and on the enforcement side, I, that's not my world, um, but the um, enforcement officers, and I'll read from that, uh, enforcement officers need the backing of a traffic ordinance based on an engineering and traffic study. Um, never establish speed limits artificially low to slow irrational drivers. It doesn't work. If speed limits are set too low for a particular road or street, even responsible drivers will usually exceed the limit. Enforcement then becomes unnecessarily time consuming and a drain on resources. So that's, that is, I think, a, a very compelling point of view. I've heard that for all my years involved in this, over 30, um, and it's, it's, um, it's something that hasn't changed, um, but it, it can be um, difficult to overcome the emotional side of it from people who actually live there and experience it, especially with young children. So I get it. I understand the sidewalk side of it. Um, I believe it does need sidewalks on both sides. I hope we can do that, but those changes do take time and a great deal of money. So. Okay, thank you. And do you have something yes. to add? <clears throat> thank you. I apologize. I'm not fully aware of your process it's here. It's okay. <laughs> and what it's appropriate to ask the question. <coughs> um, my understanding, having, having listened tonight, is that uh, you have a traffic study that recommends 30 miles per hour, and you have a, a lot of citizens that are recommending 20. Um, and then, uh, then I started to lose touch a little bit when you were talking about the budget, the cost to implement, and the cost to police that. As if, uh, in my opinion, there wouldn't be a delta between you're going to have to implement a 30 mile per hour speed limit if you follow the study. You know, but what 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 differentiates 25 to 30? I think 25 is more impactful to a driver. Uh, what work product has to happen outside of printing twos or threes? you know, on that sign right there, right? Uh, it, it's an honest question it, between the two. If you can differentiate, you know, what extra work, what extra funding would have to be improved, what extra impacts uh, or are borne by whichever office between the, the 25 to 30 miles per hour. Is that my comment about the traffic coming? If you actually want to change the nature of the street, make it smaller, add better protections for pedestrians, bike lanes, that takes infrastructure money. So yeah. that's what I meant by cost. Right. And so we'd have to put those into our capital budget. I'm just saying that right. would be delayed. So wanting to do something before then as soon as possible. Right. Okay. But to I have understand. it backed up so that people's nature will slow them down because the street's appearance has been changed. Okay, okay. good, just one last comment. Um, I've spent before in my life, I've, I've worn the brunt of a ticket or two, and it was not a calming experience for me. In fact, it was informative and it was teaching. So as opposed to signs, you know, welcoming people and incentivizing them to slow down in that extremely fast area, um, it would be good to see some policing uh, against the established speed limits already. And I love the radar signs. Something about psychologically seeing the red the lights flash like that and stop the on your track. So keep up stuff like that. That's my last one. Okay. Point. Thank you. Um, yeah, go ahead. And then I and then I have a comment. So go ahead. Okay. A, a brief comment. Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Uh, Mary Dobbins, again, Berlin Street. Um, just to say on the, uh, the, uh, the cost factor, again, uh, didn't I read somewhere that Montpelier has money for signage or something? I'm not sure, but I know to help the calming effect, and it wouldn't cost that much more to say welcome to Montpelier at the top of the hill and say you are entering a residential neighborhood and let people know. That will calm down some people. We have visitors to our state capital that come in off I-89 up there, so maybe it's not our residents or all these commuters all the time, but that's a, still a significant significant amount of people and I'll take anybody who stops who's not hit okay even if it's five percent I mean that's a that's worthwhile right there anybody who can be slowed it's worth doing this thank you so anyway all right it's not that much additional cost for that amount I don't believe 
Okay, I have a question and then. I have a quick question. Does it, um, quick, enforcement create revenue? There is, there is revenue, yes, um, a percentage that would come back to the city uh, whenever a ticket is issued under, uh, in this case, Title, you know, title 23, 10,007, which refers to municipal ordinance. Um, Vicki, if it's really quick, and then I want to keep going. Okay. How much um, would we be out should somebody get hit? Now that the there's been a great number of us that have requested assistance, um, what if somebody gets hit? Well, so that's a great question, and actually my comment um, um, yeah. sort of pertains a little bit to that. Um, and then Ashley, you have a comment. Um, so. Uh, Chief Agos, one of the things that you said um, was that if we were go to go with 25, that that would basically be, I just want to make sure I understood you correctly, that it would basically be unenforceable because the study did not support that. At, at this time, that is correct. I mean, it has to be, we have to, it has to be a valid speed limit. So if we now, went, if there's a valid, so I'm just yeah. going to leave it this. As long as it's valid, we will do everything that we can. As we, and I think for example of that, where it was a very challenged street, was many, many years ago on Main Street Hill. And for, for your perspective, a report would need to support that in order for it to be valid? So it needs to be a legal report that stands up in court, as, as Councilor Hill discussed. OK. Um, Ashley. Um, so I was doing a little digging. I remember uh, growing up, I think this was one of, one of the a uh, few meetings that my grandparents actually took me to city council about was uh, speed limits. And so I happened to, uh, I was curious to see how the town that I grew up in in upside down Vermont had handled this. Um, and uh, it's a significantly larger city at this point. I think there's probably about 38,000 people that live there now. Uh, however, they uh, used the same tools to gather data. And uh, in Dover, New Hampshire, where a posted speed limit was 30, uh, the uh, 85th percentile was 40 miles, between 38 and 40 miles per hour in a posted 30 mile per hour zone. Uh, and in a posted 25 mile per hour zone, uh, they, uh, the mean speeds were between 26 and 30. Uh, so at least in that community, you know, 30 meant 40, sort of, and, you know, and 25 meant no greater than 30 generally. So just um, putting that out there for some context. Okay, are there any further comments from the council? not is there a motion oh um i guess i will close the public hearing assuming yes. that there's no further thoughts okay i move we amend the ordinance to uh, reduce the speed limit on berlin street as indicated from 35 to 30. second further discussion if one has an amendment to make i think you could i think you could make that now. Yep. I would um, move that we amend the 30 mile per hour speed limit to 25. Yeah. For the entire length. Uh, for the entire length. Okay. Is there a second? I'll second it. Okay. Uh, further discussion? Um, uh, Connor, then Donna, I guess. And then Lauren, did you have something? Okay. No, no, she said you. Yeah. I, I, I think where I'm at is I'm just uncomfortable voting for something that might not be enforceable. Um, you know, you can change the number on a sign, but I think we need to change the culture. And that entails resources and a 360 degree look at this, as far as traffic calming, enforcement. Um, otherwise, you're like writing a letter to yourself, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I've spoken to a lot of residents on North Street, where it's 25 miles an hour right now, and they feel it's like Thunder Road up there. Um, so I, 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 I again, I believe in looking at a citywide approach on this. I think the points are very valid that were raised today. I, would, I don't want to mess with residents of Berlin Street. You guys are pretty organized. Um, <laughs> We've but, been forgotten for so long. But uh, at this point, I'm not comfortable uh, voting for the 25. I think 30 is a step in the right direction, and I think we need further discussion on this um, in the future. So. Uh, Don. Well, my question about uh, the motion, Ashley, is 
I would like to see us explore the 25 and to move in that direction. But I would like to post something right now that I know we can enforce. So is, is there a way, Ashley, to modify your amendment? Um, I was just reading this one case that, I think, well, the statutes have changed somewhat since then, but if there's a... Got to speak in the mic. There's a 1994 case from the Vermont Supreme Court out of, well, it arose in Danville. Um, decrease in limit, but not to less than 25 miles per hour. Um, I mean, I I appreciate the olive branch. I just, I, I, to me, like the 25 just makes more sense. And if 25 proves to be too slow for whatever reason, but the commercial traffic coupled with, like I drive Berlin Street almost every morning and it always feels a little white knuckled because there are kids and there are pets and people everywhere and I I appreciate I'm not it disputing though. No, that, no, I know. Okay. But I'm asking the legality of it. If we indeed pursue so that we could do it legally. I think uh, there are, I mean, I'm not the city attorney, but I have certainly litigated a similar issue and I guess my sort of takeaway was have the people in the room who were involved in making the decision if there ever comes a time where there is a question that would be litigated not you know in city council chambers that would be at the judicial bureau and then potentially uh, superior court but i think that for all of the reasons that have been articulated we've had a robust public hearing there have been lots of public comments uh, and i and i think that it's important that um that we acknowledge that you know this isn't just about you know putting on the brakes. These are these are our neighbors and these are our friends and these are our, our neighborhood kids. And um, you know if if we want to be the kind of city where people want to be outside and do all of that, I feel like part of that is is making the least pedestrian friendly things in our community, which are cars, uh, you know, operate in such a way that that demonstrates significant respect and and deference to pedestrians. Uh, Lauren. So I'm kind of at a point similar to Connor of I am very sympathetic and really appreciative of the comments. I live up off of Terrace Road, which is a similar hill, and it's 25, and it kind of has a similar feel, and 25 seems to work there. But I do really struggle with voting tonight on something that we, like to me, the way I read the information we were given from the lawyers was we need a solid case that's kind of clearly laid out of why we're deviating from the traffic study. And although I think we heard a lot of really good points that could possibly be compiled, I think we would have to look at what's not in the traffic study that we feel like was missed and and somehow is, and we can lay that out so that we could bring that to defend. I think it would be hard to say what we heard tonight is somehow, you know, with data uh, and other things could refute the traffic study. So I'm just struggling with how could we stand up and defend that, even though I think it could very well be a great idea to do that, but I, I don't feel ready to vote on that this evening. Uh, Donna. Would you feel more inclined if with the motion we said change it to 25 and meanwhile work on the statistics to support it? Sorry. Donna, do you mean change it to 30 now and work no, on this? No, no, I mean if tonight to change it to 25 and meanwhile make the commitment to consider to work on the data that's laid out in the ordinance, in the statute, I'm sorry. Because it, it's Possibly, not illegal until someone takes it to court. It's not right. illegal until someone takes it to court. So we could change it to 25 and we could commit ourselves to provide the data and make our arguments solid. But meanwhile, it's been changed. Um, uh, so I was just going to add sorry. that um, I'm not going to try to sway one way or the other what you do. I would say if you're seeking guidance about what to do, I would note that when Main Street was made 25, I think the, count, the um, speed study came in at a different recommendation, as I recall. But this is a long time ago in memory. And so you could, we could take a look at that and see what 
the council used as evidence if that was where you want to go. If you're, if you're comfortable with 30, great. If you're not, if you're thinking about 25, we could look at what was done there. And I believe there was a challenge, and I don't, it's still 25, so um, we must have won the challenge. Uh, Jack. Responding to Donna, I, I don't like the idea of, for one thing, I think 30 is a reasonable speed on, on that street, but beyond that, I don't like the idea of saying uh, we're going to do something uh, that the evidence does not support and then go out and try to uh, find additional evidence to support it. Um, I don't think that's a rational way for the uh, for a government to proceed. Um, with regard to Tom's uh, point, that it's, I mean, I'm sorry, with Bill's point, that it's true that the uh, speed limit on Main Street is, continues to be 25, and I'm sure that the reason for that is that the city council has never changed it once it was set at 25. That doesn't mean that some other entity said we're not enforcing uh, the speed limit at 25. No, I'm sorry, I should have clarified. It was actually reduced from 35 to 25 at that time. I thought, yeah, I said it's because it's at 25, yeah. Right, but it wasn't at the time the council made the decision. Um, Donna, did you have something to say? Well, I feel like it's not going out and creating it. I've just heard there's a lot of data that maybe we haven't collected that could be part of the argument. Um, so we do have a, um, a motion and a second and an amendment uh, and a second. Um, another possibility, too, um, is that we could uh, we could table it to do some investigation, um, and you know look at the case of, of Main Street, and see what kind of evidence was used there, um, and uh, see if that would be applicable in this situation. I I am open to any any of these suggestions, team. Um, but uh, uh, Glenn, yes. Uh, just to. Uh, state my current position, I would much rather lower the speed limit now to 30 and work from there to make physical changes to the road through traffic coming so that the actual speeds on the road drop, revisit and lower it to 25 as soon as possible as needed. I would, I would prefer to take some action tonight and I think that the action indicated for now is 30. Just checking. Does anybody want to table it? No. Okay. <laughs> Just checking. It's not fair to all these people. Okay. Well, I thought I'd put it out there. All right. Um, so we do have a motion and a second on on the um, amendment. Uh, any further discussion on making it 25? Uh, Lauren? So, I mean, I'm still inclined. I mean, I think, you know, we could vote tonight to go to 30 based on the recommendation, but with an understanding that there's going to be a look for could we build the case for 25 and come back in the next couple of weeks and do that. I really don't feel comfortable voting for something that I don't feel like we've got the foundation for yet, even though I think, but I think we could build it and look at it. But so that's kind of where I am. I'm, I'm fine okay. moving ahead that way. I don't know if, you know, there's some um, understanding of don't start printing the signs yet or <laughs> yeah. how the implementation of that yeah. goes if if we wanted to set a firm you know we'll take this up in two weeks at the next yeah. meeting um, to see if and if you know we could work with Years. citizens Years. on the um, on building that case um, in the interim okay uh, any further comments on the amendment okay um, all in favor please say aye this aye. aye this is the 25. I'm sorry, you, you, I'm going to have to ask you to do that again because I didn't hear everybody. Um, this is on the 25. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Oh, yeah, okay. A show of hands. So the ayes, I think, were two, and the noes were four. So the noes have it, so the amendment does not pass. Um, so now we're back to the original amendment, which is um, to change it to 30, um, which there was a motion and a second. Um, any further discussion on uh, this amendment, or uh, not amendment, I'm sorry, this motion? 
Nope. Okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. And so, do you want a, a hand hand raise for that as well? So the eyes. Same four. Same, yeah, same, same two. Same, same four. Go. Same two. Uh, just flipped. Um, Okay, um, so the motion passes, so we're definitely moving it to 30, um, at least for now. I just wanna make a note of some other things that I felt like I heard during um, the discussion, which I wanna make sure that we are paying attention to. Um, one is uh, you know, definitely having some kind of a reduced um, speed ahead sign and welcome to Montpelier um, as people are entering uh, you know, from, uh, from the Berlin uh, side. Uh, something your report uh, noted, Tom, was about adding the possibility of, of adding a sidewalk um, on or having a sidewalk on, on both sides. Um, I think that's that's something that I would want to flag for uh, the capital improvement um, discussion, which uh, is not for a little while yet, but want to make sure that we are, are paying attention to that. Um, and then, you know, looking at the traffic calming um, options that we have, you know, whether that's putting um, radars out there um, or if we need to do some narrowing or redesigning, you know, with like bulb outs or, uh, or what have you. Um, I want to also come back to Lauren's um, suggestion that um, perhaps with it being 30 right now, um, can we look at the possibility of building a case um, for 25, um, there's no reason, I don't think, to delay in that. Uh, so if we can, um, you know, look at what happened with, uh, say, Main Street, or uh, if there, if we can cite something like, um, you know, the presence of um, children or whatever it is, if you know that's if that's the case, then um, let's let's dig into that. Um, so. It, um, thoughts thoughts on on that last bit. Yes, well, Don. Just so you know, Berlin Street is on the capital improvement plan through the MTIC, the Transportation Infrastructure Committee. I don't remember what year, but I can check enrolling that in with other improvements. Okay. But I'm also asking the Montpelier Transportation Infrastructure to take up traffic calming for Berlin Street in August. Great. And, and we'll put a posting out, and if we can leave me your emails, one or two of you, then you can have a neighborhood connection if you want to join that conversation. Cool. Is there do we need to make a motion if we want to do the signs? Or? Um, I don't know that we, what do you think? Do we, we don't need a motion for that, do we? Or? Uh, enough for uh, METCD compliant signs and the speed limit uh, reduction and the warning, advanced warning. Um, the odd thing about the welcome signs is that if it's not in compliance with MUTCD, oh. we can't place it in the right of way. So I've got to look into that further. I didn't okay. get a chance to do that, but it's it's a, kind of an anomaly in the in the state statute that the part of a traffic calming plan you can do it, but a um, um, but just to place a, a welcome to Montpelier sign um, in the right of way is is not allowed. If you look at all of our other um, welcome to Montpelier signs are set way back from the highway and the reason is they have to be on somebody's private property. If we can get somebody's permission to do that, we can do it fairly quickly. But. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, any interest uh, in uh, looking further into exploring 25? Oh, yeah. Um, I, I would, if there were a motion to that effect so that we also, you know, had some kind of a deadline for ourselves, that would be great. Um, thoughts on or if you want to make a motion. Is this uh, a motion to request a further study for 25? I'm not sure exactly what. Is that? Um, I think yeah, my only suggestion would be to look at, uh, you know, I'm going by long memory, you'd be look at the facts of what happened on Main Street, because I don't know what I've got right and wrong at this point, but to see what was done and why it was done and what the rationale was and to see if it's parallel here or not, I don't know. So does it make sense to start with a report on, a report on, on yeah. what happened with Main Street and then yeah. use that as a catalyst? Um, yes, Ashley. So just a, a couple of things. So I was looking again at 23 VSA uh, section 1007, and actually subsection D uh, would addresses this at least in five years' time, which says special regulations have full force and effect of law. Um, oh, no, sorry. Uh, 
uh, it is subsection E, lack of evidence of a traffic and engineering study will not invalidate a local speed limit ordinance as adopted or amended, uh, yada, 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 after five years. But then I looked at this case that they reference. It's literally an entry order. And the facts are really important in that case because uh, the state, the prosecutor, the prosecuting officer or attorney was uh, unable to produce anyone from the city who could point to any traffic study, any public hearing, or any other thing that had happened. Um, and it's literally a, a paragraph uh, entry order, which you know uh, basically indicates that the the state had, when the issue was raised, the state then had the burden to bring in someone from the city. They brought in the uh, the assistant city clerk of South Burlington, uh, and she indicated she she didn't have any copies of any traffic control or calming study or anything. So the state, in essence, introduced zero evidence um, in in the case. So I, I think the fact that there is public hearing and, and lots of testimony taken and a report prepared with compelling uh, information would be sufficient after reading the paragraph. Um, so, oh, Tom, and then, uh, yeah, if, if what you're suggesting occur, a study and re further review, um, I'm, I'm a little confused. Uh, changing a lot of signs and beginning active enforcement right. is... Okay, um, but now I'm, I'm confused about what what the plan is that the city manager outlined as, as far as the um, additional study, what the city council is, is wanting to, the city manager to perform. I, as far I think as the, the city council asked that we provide a report on what happened on Main Street and what the facts were and what do we yeah. do we move forward with changing signs but, but, and publishing yeah. this as a, is my question meanwhile we've told staff that we're changing it to 30 they're going to do all the signs all the public notices uh, I, you that's i know i'm just um, isn't that the problem long? you haven't passed that motion yet i'm saying that's what, you know. um tom how long does it take to make a sign uh, we purchase them i don't know if we'll make them in house or buy them off the shelf but um I, i've got to work it into a work okay. plan to do it and i need to check with the city clerk I think this is published um, for a period of time if I'm not mistaken so well I think for now um, all we're looking at is just some some further information so until there's any different direction um, assume the answer is it's 30 okay, okay. Um, and uh, so if there's interest in a report on what happened with Main Street, if it's analogous, uh, I think it would be helpful to have a motion to that end, if anyone wants to do that. If not, that's fine. Um, possibly having a motion regarding um, asking for, or, or can, do we need a motion? Directing we, don't need staff. A motion. we don't need a motion. Yeah, I can do okay. That okay, so we'll... Won't take long. Okay, great. So we'll look into what happened with Main Street, if it's analogous, and we'll go from there. Okay. All right. Well, thank you all for uh, coming out and testifying. Um, very grateful for uh, all the organizing that, that happened there to, to get you all here. It was wonderful. Uh, and uh, I think we should take a five minute break. Okay. Well, we're going to come back from our um, five minute break. Uh, and so we are up to the report and um, budget from uh, Montpelier Live in the Downtown Improvement District. So welcome, Dan. Thank you. Dan Grober, Montpelier Live Director, resident of Montpelier. I will keep it very brief, <laughs> and you are welcome to ask as many questions as you'd like. Um, as you know, the City Council essentially contracts with Montpelier Live to manage uh, a portion of the Downtown Improvement Funds. That equals about $60,000. The City Council has set uh, the goals outlined on page one for the Downtown Improvement District, um, and we uh, utilize those funds to do um, marketing of Montpelier, uh, including uh, printed materials like our new Experience Montpelier tourism brochure that I handed around, um, to take photos of Montpelier that we use in marketing, uh, to keep our website, which is really a tourism-oriented um, piece, um, up and running. Um, and to create an attractive downtown with um, attractive streetscape, public artwork, holiday decorations, uh, and really vibrant events. 
Uh, so we've done a lot of work in the last year. You will see it outlined in this report. I'm happy to answer any questions about it. Um, we are tasked each year with presenting a budget to City Council for how we intend to spend the funds for your approval. Um, on, I forgot to number the pages, I apologize, but on fiscal year, which this should actually read 2020 plan, um, but it reads 2019 plan, this page. Um, our fiscal year is different from your fiscal year, so I'm totally lost. Um, but <laughs> your fiscal year 2020 um, is what we're talking about today, so the year that starts on July 1st of this year. Um, so we've presented a budget. Um, the notable uh, items are that this should be the last wayfinding signage uh, <laughs> amount in here, and we look forward to having that money freed up uh, for other uses, and thank you for approving that contract and your consent agenda tonight. Um, there, you will see $5,000 for the Public Art Commission, which is something that we discussed at the time that the Public Art Commission was formed, um, which is a, a promise that we made to them, which we hope you'll enable us to uh, keep. Um, and uh, otherwise, there is very little change other than uh, slightly reducing the advertising and marketing budget in order to uh, accommodate those other two items. Um, so. The advertising and marketing is slightly down from this year. Downtown design is fairly similar to this year. Um, and the Public Art Commission is a new addition. Um, this brochure will be distributed at state welcome centers and over 100 other locations using PPD distributors uh, starting July 1. Um, so we're really excited about having a piece that's out there for the public to see. Um, that's one of our priorities for the next year. Um, I've already had. Uh, wonderful conversations with um, National Life, who intends to use it for their Human Resources Department to be able to hand to job candidates, or with Caledonia Spirits that plans to have it at their new bar. Um, and they're also bringing it to their new kiosk that they're going to have at the airport in Burlington. Um, so this will be out and about, and uh, I think really presents a nice space to Montpelier. Um, it includes listings for every store and restaurant within the Downtown Improvement District. Um, and expanded the 25 word description is for Montpelier Live members. So if you notice the difference there. Um, but this is an example of where Montpelier Live really leverages the downtown improvement districts. We raised over $7,000 by selling advertisements in the brochure. Um, it's about a $20,000 project. So we were able to take downtown improvement districts, about half the money from downtown improvement districts, and half the money that Montpelier Live uh, raised um, to make this project happen. Um, and that's something that we do regularly. Uh, another example is cooperative advertising. Um, our holiday campaign, um, the numbers are somewhere in here. Um, we did a uh, $8,400 holiday shopping campaign using only uh, just under $1,000 in downtown improvement district funds by um, getting, basically subletting our ad space to businesses. So there was a 30 second message, for example, on the radio up front that was come to downtown Montpelier for XYZ, do your holiday shopping here, blah, blah, blah. And then three short ads from local businesses at the end. Um, so I think we use the funds very um, effectively and efficiently. And I hope you will approve our fiscal year 2020, not 19, <laughs> plan um, as outlined here. Uh, Jack. I enjoyed reading the report. I had a question on the first page of the report in your key engagement metrics. You indicate an average time of uh, 1 minute and 38 seconds on the web page. And I'm just curious, is that good? Is it more? Is it longer than before? Is it, how is it comparable to other similar web pages? What should we draw from that? Sure. Um, it's uh, good. <laughs> um, if you think about the fact that you'll have some people who come to the site and spend three seconds on it and realize that they're not in the right place, or, um, you know, so this is an average, so there are people who are spending more time than that. Um, it's very similar to the year before um, number, um, and that's a great idea that we should, I will ask around and see if other people have data that we can compare it to. Um, I know that the, the fact that the website visits are up significantly um, is part of the work that we've been doing to make improvements to the website and add really quality content. 
um, search engines like Google are ranking websites based on like how authoritative is that website on a certain subject. So the more like good quality content that we have about Montpelier, the higher we rank when people are searching for Montpelier or when people are searching for where should I visit in Vermont, things like that. So that 29% increase over a year is very significant. I would guess that uh, that duration of stay, a lot of people hit that page and it's kind of a landing page and they follow links to some of the local businesses or something like that. Ab absolutely, yeah. Um, and in fact, you see that um, we actually sometimes rank as high or higher as the actual store or restaurant's website because we have that kind of authority within, within Google. Thanks. Other questions? Donna. Well, the events have been well this last year, and your flowers are up and looking good. I mean, it's such a simple thing, but those flower baskets are just wonderful. And I really appreciate your volunteers who water them once they get up there. So. Thank you. Uh, so I want to uh, just check in on uh, the amount of the budget in total this year relative to last year. I'm not sure that there's a comparison to last year's or if there's, I didn't see it. I believe it's up by $41. We okay. went with the yeah. number that Todd close. Okay, so it's. Yeah, um, it's almost the same. Okay. Yeah, we don't anticipate any significant differences unless uh, the hotel project were to move forward. Um, we may see some difference uh, with the, um, the former gas station property if that's developed, um, mm -hmm. but the hotel would be the most significant increase that we might expect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Donna. Did you actually do the painting on the garage driveway by Julio's? That's yes. That was great. Yep, so that was one of our projects um, in terms of creating a, an attractive streetscape. Uh, $891 of DID funds uh, paid for the materials. Uh, Rob Hitzig, who's a local artist who's on our design committee, created and donated the design. And our uh, committee and, and volunteers actually did the painting. Uh, late at night one night and then did it again after it rained <laughs> five minutes after we were done with it the first time. <laughs> Fair enough. Any other questions? Uh, Connor. I, I was just thinking like bears were clean and Dan is a one man show here <laughs> yeah. with the help of like a ton of volunteers yes. and everything. Yeah. Yeah. But the amount of like product Dan kicks out just by himself I imagine it's kind of lonely sometimes, so just uh, <laughs> you you know, deserves us. a lot of credit there. Okay. <laughs> so, Thank you. Thanks very much, then. Okay. Um, uh, Maybe actually, a little unrelated. Is anyone else like incredibly warm? Like, it's, it's warm. But I'm very warm. Yeah. It's summer. I'm warm. I'm <laughs> so. Um, so, any further comments? Uh, so otherwise, we. We could have a motion. I'll make a motion that we approve the DID FY20 budget as presented. Second. Further discussion? Any comments from the public? Okay. Uh, all right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thanks, Dan. Thank you for all your great work. Okay. And so now we're on to some zoning fixes. Welcome. So I have some copies if we need things. Otherwise, um, I can put extra copies off to the side for the public if they want them. Um, so quick update. Um, I'm you sorry. Have you already made copies that are sitting in that box? Uh, there, are, I made a couple copies of each. You, you, you have copies, but I didn't know. Okay, okay. And something different than what we. No, have. it's not okay. anything different. But if somebody needed a hard copy, I do have some hard copies. Um, so you received a slightly revised uh, strikeout version last Friday. Um, and this new draft just made some minor changes to the non-conforming rules. You may remember that the um, garage appellants used uh, a pr provision of the non-conforming as a basis for part of their appeal. So we wanted our attorney to look at what our regulations say to see if there are tweaks we could make to make it clearer. Um, we believe the old version was clear, but if people, you know, are going to make a claim that it's not clear, then we should make some edits to, to clarify. So uh, they did make a couple of edits, not too substantial, but um, that was why you got a revised section. It's just Chapter 120. That was the only thing that changed. 
Um, earlier, you should have received a draft strikeout copy, um, the punch list of the zoning changes in the matrix, which if you printed out would look like that. Um, two maps and two memos from the Planning Commission. So uh, that's kind of the complete package. Um, and at this point, reviewing the changes, um, I just need we just need to figure out what we want to do for a process. Um, as I mentioned last time, there are three areas of changes that um, most of the changes are small, but there are three areas that have some policy implications. Um, the, the stream buffers for unchannelized portions in the urban center, the buildable area requirement, and um, the steep slopes um, were the three areas that would have something. And so, you know, I don't know how you would like to review it. We can start at part one and work our way through with whatever questions. We could review these three specific areas or we can just open it up for questions and comments. It's up to you, the process, as to how you'd like to go through. Um, I think we should probably start with uh, questions. And then um, just back up to uh, clarify here. So, I think it'll become clear, um, you know, through the questions whether or not we're in a place where we're ready to adopt these, or if we need more time. I mean, it, mm, uh, because the the timing of adopting them is is pretty critical, right? Uh, well, the timing of these is less critical, but it's it's kind of funky. What we're having right now aren't technically hearings; they're just meetings, because okay. under state law, as soon as we warn the hearing. The drafts go into effect, and so we don't want to have a long period of time where we're in hearings, or else it really starts to make a mess of permits. So usually, what we have is a bunch of meetings. We decide pretty much on what we think we're going to adopt, and then we have the two hearings. We try to put them close together, so that way we can get through the hearing process without making a big mess of permits. So we could potentially um, be setting our first hearing date at the end of this meeting. If you felt comfortable with what's in the draft, okay. yes. Okay. Okay, so um, questions that folks or comments that folks have on on the amendments. Oh, no. The strikeouts made sense, and, and I could read it, made sense. I just didn't have something right next to it to compare, so it looks good to me. I tried to send you a strikeout so you could look at them you pretty did. close. You did. It was great. So. It's amazing how much you struck out. It's good. Yeah, there was a lot of, of uh, some of them were, were small, as you would see, little things like changing the word lot to, to parcel. We tried to, you know, just little things like that because of a, just a technical thing. Sometimes we'd use lot, sometimes we'd use yeah. parcel. It's better to be consistent. Always, if you're going to talk about the same thing, always use the same word. And so we made a number of changes like that where we would be very, we just did global search replace and made it all consistent. Um, Sandy, did you want to uh, make a comment? When you're in public. Oh, that could be now if you would like. If you're, if you're ready. I don't want to put you on the spot. Okay. I'm ready. Okay, go for it. Um, I don't believe you're making comments to section 3103. Uh, technically, we could make comments on any section. Okay. That's why I would like to speak tonight. My name is Sandy Vitztoom, and I'd like to preface my comments, if I may, that I will try to keep to two minutes. Thank you. <laughs> and I would appreciate not being interrupted about that subject while I'm speaking. Okay. I'll do my best. Um, I'm speaking about this section, which is on community facilities because I think that this part of the ordinance um, probably started from a clear intention years ago and has become less clear as other things have changed. So um, specifically, um, the, the statutes and ordinances I'm familiar with, are the, the reason why they're in place is to uh, let municipalities in the state bypass questions of use typically, so that if they need to put a certain use in a certain place, it can happen without a lot of public review about why 
a library or a sewage treatment plant or something needs to be where it is. Um, I'm hoping that you all have this, again, to save my time about what the wording is. Do you want me to read it quickly? Oh, I okay, you all it. have it, yeah. good. Um, so the way it is worded right now is this is may only be regulated with respect to certain items that are mostly about the physical appearance of the building. Um, it's interesting that some, many things were missed in that, that clause or section and um, th some of those things are paving surfaces, uh, site improvements like furniture, driveways, configurations, parking spaces, interior roads, alternative transportation measures like sidewalks, traffic impact, steep slopes, riverfronts, um, and one thing that was mentioned tonight is there does not seem to be any uh, consideration of subdivisions and lot configurations, although that may be in a separate section because that's not really the site criteria. So um, I want to point out that one of the major changes is that the state of Vermont is moving away from review of projects uh, through the Act 250 process in downtown areas. So really what is left is review of any project at the city level for, with only a very minor review of Act 250. So most of these things cannot be considered by Act 250. My feeling strongly is that any project, including or especially a municipal project, needs to be reviewed by as many eyes as possible to make it as good as it can possibly be, safe as it can be, um, kind of well thought out as it can be. And I would hate to avoid the chance to, to review these things. So my suggestion is to actually remove a lot of wording from this. Um, so land development associated with a community facility requires approval under these regulations and then strike everything up until only to the extent that the regulations do not have the effect on, of interfering with the intended functional use. So in other words, it would take out all those details in between. I hope that makes sense. I'm mean, glad to answer any questions about that. Can you say that again? Let, so yep. striking which portion? I'll read the way I would suggest it to be. Land development associated with a community facility requires approval under these regulations only to the extent that the regulations do not have an effect of interfering with the intended functional use. I think taking out all of those specifics in the middle actually would make it clearer and more encompassing. Okay. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, thoughts on that? Uh, yes, I'd Mike. Like um, oh, okay, and then Jack. So the, okay. Yeah, so the, the primary basis for why that is in there is that is actually um, under state law. That those are the, the limitations that the state had that zoning is limited by state law. We have to have certain requirements in the zoning, including a fact that community facilities can only be regulated with respect to these um, very specific requirements. Um, we could, and what typically happens within our own applications locally, is that we usually voluntarily go through the process despite the fact that we don't have to. Um, so locally, we do. Um, we usually recognize in our reports that we do have the exemption, but we're opting to, to go through the rules. Um, and so that's where this basis comes from. And it certainly still applies to all of these other ones. Um, institutions owned by the city or state, schools and education facilities, they all also have these same things. Um, this gets typically used uh, VCA, the VCFA, um, as a college is also exempt and we can only regulate them with respect to that. Uh, any church that comes in with a proposal, we have to honor the limitations under state law um, and you, you see the rest of the list there. So it's, it's pretty typical in many cases, um, or I wouldn't say many, there's, in every community, they try to work with their partners who have exemptions. Um, I remember talking with Burlington and 
you know, one of the colleges always claims the exemption, they'll come in, get their permits, and walk out without the reviews because they're exempt from a lot of the review. Whereas another institution in Burlington always voluntarily goes through the entire process because they feel it's part of being part of the community. So that's, that's where the basis comes from, and that's why it's in there. So uh, with all of these um, details that are in here, I mean, is this just reflecting um, what is already required by the state? Like, and basically, is, I'm wondering, is, is that somehow redundant with um, state? It is redundant with okay. state law. Um, we try to put it in the regulations just because it becomes, it becomes clear for applicants and for reviewers if they don't also have to have a set of statutes next to them too. I mean, we, if, if we didn't have it in here, it would still be in effect because it's under state law that says these are the only things we're allowed to regulate. I mean, one possibility, it seems to me, is that we could just say, uh, with, uh, you know, regulated as per state statute. Was that, was that? Yes, we certainly, we certainly could. Yeah. Um, I've. I've worked with communities who would just go and say that it has to has to just be that. Um, mm -hmm. As I said, I usually like to put it in there because at some point people will want to know what that says, and if they're in a and if they're in a DRB hearing and they don't have a set of the statutes, right. then it, it would kind of be like, boy, I'd love to know whether we can or can't. Can can we regulate parking or not? Yeah. It's like, well, we could just flip it open and look and read the list and see whether it's one of the things on the list. Um. Uh, Donna, and then Sandy, did you have something to follow up? Yeah. A question, Mike. Sometimes we do refer to state statute because we know it can be changed. So if this is not a referral to a specific statute but listing it, does that mean that has to be changed when the state changes? Yeah, but, but, but it's a limitation. It would depend how it changed. Well, I just wondered yes. because other places you have referred, you have preferred to refer to the state statute and here you've included it I'm just trying to understand well, is it more frequently used or? it's more frequently used okay. um, I mean we certainly could go through let's say in this case we could put at the start of 3103 a we could say per 24 BSA 44131 a I might be right might be wrong <laughs> <laughs> somewhere in there um, Per, per that statute, comma, yeah. land development associated with, and, and then if people want to know wh where that came from, they could refer back. If there's a change in state law, it would be a fairly easy job for us to find it because we would just search by that thing and it would pop I up. prefer it to be there, but I would prefer it in other places that we took it out. So um, that's why I'm asking what's the difference. I, I prefer to put, it, to, to put them in. I'm, yeah. I'm with so you. It's so much more friendly uh, to the, your a customer. Number, yeah. yeah. Um, something to follow up, yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm quite familiar with that statute, and I actually think it would be clearer not to give examples of things that may change over time or may actually be confusing. I think it would be better to refer to the statute and, and then refer to the purpose of it, which is what you do at the end of that section or clause or whatever you want to call it. Um, I'll, I'll just say I... I tend to agree. I think if we can be not redundant um, with state statute and just let it um, uh, refer to the, the statute, that's, I think, preferable in my mind. But um, I think also having it there, it's sort of what, what you were saying, um, Mike, about the possibility of at the, at the beginnings, you know, referencing the state statute. And then if it's, you know, having it right there could be, I could see it as convenient um, so people don't have to look it up, but then you know, if it does change, that could be problematic. I think we might want to get legal advice on this because okay. this section of the statute we're currently in active litigation on. Okay. Um, and it pertains to the parking garage. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. I believe I heard Mike say that we weren't required to go through zoning, but we chose to anyway. And it, and it happens with a number of projects that we go through. It's right. not just that one. It yeah. routinely comes up where there'll be a project that the city is working on. Right. Or so. So whether we should amend it at this time yeah, may, yeah, may that's, not be. That's, that makes yeah. sense. Yeah. It'll be good enough, though. Um, no, fair enough. Uh, so let's. But stylistically, I could do it whichever way you want. I could certainly just go through and have just a section that says per section 4413 or 
Well, is is this something we can flag and then, um, which means prob maybe we're not ready to set a hearing date necessarily, um, but. Yeah, I mean, we could, I mean, there could, if that were the only issue that were there, I think that's something that could be resolved without making, okay. I don't think it would be a substantive change if and it's we not going to be conflict quoted, in the old and the new. Yeah, yeah. Quoted state law and condensed okay. it. Um, all right, other uh, comments? Uh, well, this is a, a, an aside, which I already talked to Mike about. I saw an article in the New York Times about cities questioning the American ideal house with a yard. And I know when we went through zoning, we were trying to get through some of the biases in zoning that said you couldn't build a, comp a duplex here or an apartment house here. And we've come a long ways, and it seems like the rest of the country is now following us. Uh, that single home actually is now the zoning is being changed so they can't exclude non-single home units in neighborhoods. It's a very interesting article. I know that some of you told me when I forwarded New York Times you couldn't always open it, but it's very lengthy. But I'll forward it and those of you who can't open it, uh, let me know and maybe I can try to print it out. I just did a few pages here. But, but right now, the zoning is such that in 75% of the residential land in America, it's illegal to build anything other than a detached single family home. That's how far afield was our bias to have a single home and a yard. Hmm. So I just want to note that, that we've done some improvements. I think the way you worded it was four units we now allow. Yeah, in all, in all of Montpelier, you can have a single family home or a duplex as a permitted use and you can have up to a four unit building assuming you have the density for it four unit building as a conditional use in any any district in the city so we've we allow quite a lot in multifamily in most of the districts yeah, so. I think that's important Glad we did it. Uh, Jack I just wanted to mention, and uh, I don't know, I, we might want to uh, send this to the whole council before we take this up, uh, but uh, Connor and I have met with and corresponded with a constituent who has some concerns about the uh, steep slopes uh, designation and rules and so forth. And I, I don't know if we, I'm not proposing to go into a great detail discussion about it now, but I would suggest that that correspondence be forwarded to the entire council so that uh, when we take this up at a public hearing, people will know what we're talking about. Donna. Is that different than we got previously about steep slopes? Yeah, it's pretty much the same. I okay. don't know that there are big differences. Okay. But, okay. but there's another round of correspondence, so. Yep, yep. Okay, any further thoughts? Uh, Lauren. Um, just on the steep slopes point, I mean, I, I'm just kind of curious the thinking around, so adding in the line in section 3007, um, so now we're saying that we want to allow appropriate development on or near steep slopes and to limit disturbing. So new language, it seems like we're encouraging steep slope development as long as it's well designed, which seems not what I, the direction I would want to be going, knowing especially with climate change and more frequent and extreme rain events predicted and so on, developing steep slopes. Like I know we live in a steep town and we have to allow for <laughs> that. Um, and I think that the rest of it does allow for it with the language seems fine, but putting that in our purpose just kind of concerns me. That seems to encourage it in a way that it's not currently encouraged. Which number are you actually reading on so that? Our section 3007, steep slopes, and A, the purpose. So we're adding language to that we intend previously, and maybe, that maybe I don't know if something was deleted that's not reflected here, but um, it's in it was intended to limit disturbing or clearing steep slopes to protect public safety, et cetera. And now we're saying that the way I read it is that we, we want to allow appropriate development as long as it's designed well. So it 
kind of seems proactively encouraging development on steep slopes as long as it's well designed. And I, I imagine your constituent was hopeful that that's exactly the direction the city was going. But, um, well, but, but I um, remember. Rem yeah, good. Yeah, what yeah. I remember from that discussion was there was some land that was totally not allowed any development because way over here was a steep slope. It was just so unrealistic. Um, it wasn't so much that intention, but it was to rebalance it. So maybe the wording needs to be changed there. Yeah. I mean, the way I would read the rest of it is you would still be able to develop that, but just putting that in our purpose seems to predispose you towards supporting steep slopes, whether or not it's the only place on the parcel you could develop, if that's how we de like define the purpose of um, Jack. Would you feel better about it if the, se if the purpose section said something like intended to regulate development on or near steep slopes so as to limit disturbing or clearing mm -hmm. steep slopes for development, which just, it doesn't yeah. substantively change it, but it changes what uh, might change what the emphasis is. Um, possibly. I mean, I, I think striking that new language and just saying that the section is intended to, to limit does not prohibit, it just limits. And then you've got this process you can go through if you make the case and have your hearing and have your engineering to show that you can do it safely and meet your, our criteria of protecting public safety and minimizing erosion and so on, then you should still be able to do those developments. Okay. Um, but it just, it's just a change of emphasis. And I don't know, Mike, if you. No, I mean, I can, I can see why you would make that recommendation. Um, it probably could work without the new addition. I mean, the section still is intending to limit disturbing or clearing steep slopes for development. It's not, it doesn't say prohibit disturbing or clearing, right. um, but I think Jack's regula um, you know, regulating development in order, you know, I think either one can work. It's, you know, it, it really is the purpose statement what is it we're trying to accomplish? Do you want to take it back and think about it? Um, yeah. Or does that, does that wording work for you to regulate and um, uh, I forget what else. That, the, the, the yeah, that language operating. works for me too. Yeah, but okay. If the council thinks it works just as well to strike it, I think, I don't, I don't think it loses anything to strike it either, so. Oh, to, to, to just strike. To strike the, the new stuff the new stuff, but. Got you. Um, other thoughts? Go ahead, Glenn. Uh, <laughs> splitting it even still further. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> what if we uh, struck the new language and changed the word limit to regulate? So we say this section is intended to regulate the disturbance or clearing of steep slopes for development in order to. And that feels like it's, t to me, that feels like it is fairly balanced. It's not saying we're limiting it. It's just saying we're regulating it, and it doesn't feel encouraging. To me, we want to limit steep slope I hear explicitly. That. <laughs> we want to allow it where it needs to happen, and the example we were given seemed like a reasonable kind of example where prohibiting it is not practical in a town like Montpelier. But, um, but I think we... I, I personally think we want to be limiting steep slope development where practicable. I'm, f I'm, I'm fine with I'm fine with that. Um, Connor. So, so if we struck the new language, it would have no practical impact on the rest of it. <laughs> Which right? would make me sleep better. <laughs> it's it's it, apparently. Sleep better, so. we, we do not cite the purpose statement when we are um, okay. doing the regulation. The purpose is to. <laughs> Yeah. So we're gonna. I'm okay with strike. So we're gonna yeah. strike it. Is that where where we've landed? Yeah. Generally yeah. speaking, team. Okay. <laughs> Just we're striking the new language. Okay. Okay. Cool. Great. Any other comments? Um. Uh, go ahead, Lauren. I just had a question in the back to section 1002, the very beginning, the purpose of our. So we've got this great. Sorry, can you say the section again? So section 1002. So right at the beginning. Like the Another first page of text. Statement. Okay. Yep. Um, 
we've got the purpose, and we mentioned that we want to promote development that protects and conserves natural, agricultural, scenic, and historic resources and other goals. I'm just wondering, we have this great net zero goal, too, and some development. I was wondering about thinking about putting that explicitly into our the purpose of how we're wanting to do development. We might have other city goals that could similarly be added, so that might open a whole can of worms, um, but just wondering about that concept. I would say we do a limited amount of net zero energy work through the zoning. Um, there's a little bit that talks about where buildings are sited and how they're oriented. A little bit with shading of potential solar facilities and those types of things, but it's it, uh, a lot of our net zero goals would probably be more in our building codes and, and other regulations rather than, I mean, certainly you could put a statement in here to that effect. Again, it's a purpose statement, um, but there, it's not a, generally a set of rules that are used to really advance that goal. Um, I would think that if we're if we wanted to add, um, you know, net zero to it, I, I would want to have either some further things uh, in this document that we were also planning on adding or. Um, my guess is that it would. I would love to. I would love to have that conversation, but I, I think that might take some time. I've also been advised that um, zoning is a very blunt tool to try to get anything done um, with in terms of uh, um, net zero. Um, so I would want to. I mean, fair, right? Like I'm. I'm obviously like in, into that, um, but I, I think I would want to have some more conversation about how that applies. And um, if we were going to go down that road, like let's really take some time. Yeah, I would think the, you know, the fundamental underpinning of zoning is land use. And so if you're talking about net zero, it would be more encouraging, Cluster. more cluster development, more you know, walkable type things, closer to downtown. Those kinds of things would be the way through land use you'd encourage it. Then building codes would be about the materials and those sorts of you know, or you know, not creating disincentives to have solar panels or whatever types of things, you know. Does that sound right? I mean, yeah, I mean, that's what I, how I was thinking, the intersection of... But I think that would be more through how the zone, the district... And make sure that we're... Yeah. But I think... But yes, we can... Let's... let's ponder further and yeah. another process and timeline. Let's, but. Uh, let's make a note to do that, though. Okay. Great. Thanks. Um, the only comment I wanted to make was just that I was glad that uh, we have required, for any um, building that happens on steep slopes, uh, that we were requiring a um, plan by a professional engineer um, with pretty clear um, criteria for what that plan needs to include. Um, that seems reasonable to me. Other thoughts? Otherwise, we're going to probably move on. Okay. Um, uh, pending this question about um, community facilities, um, can we set a hearing uh, date? When when makes the most sense for for you? Do you want to do it in the next? Actually, we we do have a list of upcoming agenda items. I think we had planned. I think I had assumed that we would have one more public one meeting. So I think I I had in my head. Thought end of August, first week of sep first time in September. What is the approximate calendar? Um, end of August would be um, ten twenty three. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. that's October. Eight. I can't read this right. Okay, um, sorry. Eight eight twenty eight would be the second. Eight twenty eight, and then there was a nine. And then September eleventh. September eleventh. So that's good. They're close together. They're fairly close. So. Because I think my concern was I think there was a big jump between the July and the August. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's only right, one we, in We skip August. a week. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Cool. And I need 30 days to warn them anyway, so I will. It gives me a little window of time to get that out. And did you want to do another um, sort of in, more informal meeting about, um, you know, regarding the zoning before then? Um, Certainly, it looks like it might be on for um, eight fourteen. 
issue that comes with 814 is that um, we couldn't make any changes because the hearing was warned for the 28th. Oh, I see. So that's the trick. Uh, if we if we had uh, one, did, uh, but we are hoping to have one more of these uh, meetings, or 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 no? Uh, we could. I was figuring the the <laughs> meeting in July, unless that's. Uh, what do you think, I'm team? Ha I'm happy with not doing yeah. it. We uh, yeah. it was noticed today. There's not been a lot of uh, public input or interest. We're going to have two public hearings. I would just set the public hearings for August 28th and September 11th. You said there's an August 14th meeting as well? Yes. Did you want to do the 14th and the 28th? That's two weeks as well. I thought there was a missing the, it's council the meeting. last July one that's missing. Ah, all right. Yeah. Um, either way. Are we going to have good council attendance? Are people going on vacation in August? I'm gone the 14th. Okay. I'll be here. Do you, um, do you need a motion to set yes, those Yes, I dates? think we do. That we set the... So, I, well, oh, yeah, while you, uh, you know, that's a good point. I mean, we haven't had a huge amount of public involvement, but nonetheless, I think we'd have bigger public involvement in August 28th and September 11th than we would in the yes. 14th and the 28th. So if we wanted to have it when more people are around and at least provide that opportunity, yeah. it would probably be better. I don't, I'm not trying to push it off, but zoning and people usually want to weigh in. No, people no, are gone fair. in August. Okay. So, so yeah, we want critical. a motion to set yeah. the public hearing on the zoning? Yeah, oh, yeah, on zoning. August 28th and September 11th. Second. For the discussion. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, so we will have our formal hearings then. And if anybody has any questions, um, between now and then, you're more than welcome to shoot them my way, and I will answer and clarify. And and Jack is and Connor going to send us the, the the query that you got from one of your constituents. And I'll yeah. work with Bill to get the whatever the thing is on community facilities oh. to see what what David Rue would recommend and get you something to think about. Okay. Well, I agree with you. It's not going to be a substantive change. I just, I'm yeah. just nervous about changing it at all while we're litigating it. Okay. okay. All right. So we are moving on to, um, thank you, by the way. All right. So, excuse <clears throat> me. We're moving on to the first reading of. Uh, in chapter five, uh, which is pertaining to the fire department. So I believe this is a, um, uh, is this public hearing? Yes. It is public hearing. So I'm going to officially open the public hearing. Um, so comments or questions, in, uh, unless, um, Bob, there's something you would like to no, preface I us don't. with? No, uh, okay. Any questions? Most of, it was, most of it was cleaning up language and, and the, you know, we removed that large section on fire districts the inner district and the outer district that's you know it doesn't pertain anymore most of um, the changes also ref are now reflective in the, our building code mm -hmm. so that's where a lot of it is has gone to so mm -hmm. there were just and if you want I can just today going over we found just a couple other things on page two uh, 5.6 report of a fire hydrant use and it should be to the water department not the water commissioner we don't just the wording change there. Yeah. And then in the next one, 5.7, um, talks about the fire alarm telegraph damaging it, and that was has been removed from service. So, yeah, that, 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 that system has been removed from service, and I missed that the first time through, but I found it today. So. What, what have you guys been typing over here? Yeah. <laughs> so no Morse code requirement for... No more, yeah. There was, though, at one time. Yeah. yeah. How, how long ago was that removed? Well, the box alarm system, right. uh, which it was is part of that system, was just. I was here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, so within the last. Tom Blanc was, was on council. Yeah. 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 It hasn't been that long, but it was. 
certainly outdated and it was time for it to go. So um, I have um, a couple of questions yes. um, about this. So uh, for example, um, section 5-11 and 5-12, um, one is about um, street fires without a permit or leaf burning without a permit. Um, I just want to clarify, we're not, it's, uh, burning leaves is still not okay, but it's just, it's moved where? Yeah, we moved that, it all into okay. 513 okay. to the outdoor oh, okay. burning yeah. section. Okay. And that was, uh, um, H3. Yeah. 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 So and we, so we cleaned that language up and, um, it hasn't been that long ago when, and uh, where we allow, um, a person to have a campfire mm -hmm. without getting a fire permit so if you have a a regular ring or something you want to have a campfire you don't have to get a permit from the fire department anymore mm -hmm. okay so it's just all collapsed into that yes uh, it's yeah. not otherwise called out elsewhere right and you know okay. eliminated the burning in the streets and things like yeah that. yeah so, fires in the street okay <laughs> well great uh any other questions about this section uh lauren um, just on section 5.5, five, the bottom of um, page one. So I'm just trying to read the strikeout. So it, like this, starting in the second line, except for the purpose of having the same repaired or in response to a mutual aid compact request for assistance or town or city. Just seems oh, like yes, it's, it's a typo. Like it needs the yeah, um, okay, you're right. yeah. assistance or in a neighboring town or city. Is that what right, I was supposed yeah. to read? Okay. So Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah, we'll fix that. Yep. Okay, uh, Ashley. Um, on Section 5403, the penalty, I know one of the things that we have talked about a few times was incorporating restorative justice. Um, so talking about penalties, a civil penalty of up to $500, and the loss of privilege for future permits may also be imposed. Um, uh, you know, I would also... Uh, you know, put in there potentially some some community justice center component if there's an issue that arises, you know, okay. in, a, in a neighborhood or with a neighbor about a, an unauthorized burn or something like that. Oh, are you talking about the fireworks section? No. Um, five, four, uh, well, I guess it is there, but. Yeah, it is under the fireworks, yeah. chapter five. It's on the fireworks, okay, I was missing that. Five four zero three. Oh yeah, in, in yep. fireworks. Yes, down at the bottom. Yeah, that seems. Yeah, that make yeah right. It seems reasonable. Yeah. Yeah, you know, we're trying to do that with all of our penalties. Mm -hmm. So yes. Okay. Great. Any other comments? Okay. Any comments from the public? Okay. All right. So we're gonna uh, close the public hearing on that and. Uh, uh, I think we do. We need to. Second reading would be the next meeting. Do we need a, a, a motion for that? We probably do. Yeah. Yep. Um, go ahead, I Jack. move that we hold a second okay. public hearing for this on uh, July 10th. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Uh, opposed. Okay. Great. And then when we do the building code section, what it's six, chapter six. I can't. You'll you'll see where a lot of the this goes. It's. Okay. Yeah. They kind of go together. Yeah. Okay. Great. Super. Thank you. Uh, all right. So that is the end of our regular business. Um, this is great. So ending a little before 10 here. It's awesome. Uh, maybe. It's yet to be told. To yeah. <laughs> anything could happen still. Um, who would like to start? I'm just going to pick on Lauren if you. Sure. Okay. Go ahead, Lauren. Um, so. Just a couple of things. I wanted to let um, let people know that one of the um, sections of the ordinances has gotten slowed down because of me. Um, so I'm looking into some um, language around toxic chemical discharges to our water supply. So just want to let people know. I'm, um, Jamie's been helping, and I'm doing some research on how he can clarify, and especially in light of um, like the Bennington contamination with toxic chemicals of drinking water and so on, ensuring that we're um, having good ordinances that make sense for um, safe drinking water um, and surface water. Um, and 
wanted to note, and Anne was there as well, but there is a group um, that has started convening looking at the um, energy efficiency ordinance. Um, so there's um, a process going on there. So work is going to be um, going on and the start of um, public process and other things, um, looking for, for feedback on some of the ideas and looking at what's been done in other um, parts of the country and so on. So look out for that, but just wanted to provide that update. Go ahead, Jack. In light of the discussion tonight about uh, safe uh, traffic at the uh, tra Transportation Infrastructure Committee uh, next, uh, next week, um, one of the items on the agenda is a uh, review of the draft uh, traffic calming policy. And so people members of the public might want to come or just let you know that this this is coming up the uh, the notice of hearing of meeting that we got says July 3rd um, July 2nd actually July 2nd it's a, it's the first Tuesday of the month and actually I'm going to propose that we cancel that meeting because oh, no. the holiday a lot of problems with attendance <laughs> okay ah. Um, I want to uh, take a quick opportunity to uh, uh, thank Sue Allen for her time with the city. Well, um, you're going to have more chance to do that. I'm, I'm sure I will. But, but first, first opportunity since it was in the paper today. Uh, um, I look forward to the last little while of working with you. And uh, uh, yeah. Sorry to see that you're on your way, but, but uh, it's been great. Um, I also want to uh, go back briefly to something that we passed as an addendum in the consent agenda that I'm really looking forward to, pancakes for the people. Um, uh, a gentleman named Eli Mutino, it looks like, is going to serve free pancakes in front of City Hall once a week for four consecutive weeks early in the morning from 7 to 10. And it, I don't see a day of the week there yet, once a week. Um, I'm, I uh, would like to suggest to Mr. Mutino that he pick Thursday so I can walk across the street and have one <laughs> uh, or two. I am a pancake expert. Uh, and <laughs> I, I would like to uh, offer my uh, critical attention to, to his uh, great initiative. And I will be at Baguito's tomorrow morning, uh, 8.30 to 9.30. All right. Well, echoing Glenn, Sue's an absolute legend. We got a, <laughs> a barn burner of a party. Uh, we got a party. party. <laughs> we'll get that going. Um, I, uh, despite saying very hurtful things, sometimes I, I did want to uh, appreciate uh, Mr. Whitaker's uh, advocacy for the homeless population in town. And, uh, you know, I actually witnessed a couple incidents last night that made me think, um, I don't feel like I have a very good understanding of what the state's role is, the designated agencies, and our own city staff as far as dealing with this population. Um, I see our police force um, really acting as like mental health officers sometimes. And I saw some, some, e e some of our EMS like actually checking vitals. I just doing great work to help people. Uh, but it, it still feels like, you know, maybe not enough is happening, and I, I don't know if it's a, maybe a matter of sitting down with the group who's working on this, or getting a report from some of the agencies and everybody who works with this population. Um, I just feel a little in the dark, and I feel like I'd, uh, we, we, maybe we'd all be better served uh, having that on the agenda, upcoming meeting, so. So are you thinking like a, um, sort of, maybe a report is the wrong word, but just hearing from groups that are, um, in, yeah, involved. Yeah. yeah, sure. And, uh, yeah, no, I just feel a bit clueless myself, so I'd like to just know more about the system overall. Um, just looking at the agenda, um, any particular? Do we have any? <coughs> do we have any committee now that works like housing on the edge of that? Is anybody? Yeah, housing task force. So maybe we could start there with a conversation and. and we might end up with another little subgroup, but at least we could start with somebody that has some information. Well, there there was a group too that um, that recently Glenn and I um, were there about um, uh, coordinating all the uh, 
the groups that uh, offer meals over the course of the day or the, the week, really, mm -hmm. um, and other um, service providers were also there. Um, so you know, uh, the uh, shelter from uh, in Barry. Uh, so you may have a list. You yeah, a list. yeah. So and and they are somewhat organized, and they're uh, they're looking to. Um, uh, coordinate with each other more um, and so I mean as, as I was there I also offered to say like how how can the city um, help and at the time the the most um, that made sense for us was to help provide um, a list of resources uh, and, and maybe that's where we start you know maybe that's uh, what we do is uh, just get everybody up to speed on the resources that exist um, and then um, part of my hope with this group is that, and I, I think part of the intention of this group was to help identify gaps. Uh, and you know, it may be appropriate for the city to step in, but it may be some other group um, where that's appropriate to step in. So um, I can either work with Bill or Jamie or whoever in terms of scheduling, and, and maybe it's with the housing task force. But um, you know, with some of the other leaders of that of that group, um, getting them here, I think, could be good. Does that, does that sound reasonable? Um, okay. Yeah. So, no, thanks, thanks very much for that. Yeah, so, so do you want to, um, I mean, maybe it makes sense to make some contacts and see when those folks are available. Um, you know, aim for sooner if we can, but um, otherwise see what their schedules are like and um, go from there. Right. Okay, super, thanks. thank you, yeah. Well, any, and, and along those same lines, I think all of you have been contacted by, is it the Migrant Justice Group? to talk about our fair and impartial policing policy that the state has and how we as a city council could maybe improve that policy. So I hope you all make that appointment. It was very informative. And I hope that when we come back, we can talk about it as a group because I think there's some action steps beyond just maybe in improving our statement, but we can do things. Mm -hmm. uh, Yvonne from the Restorative Justice Group has been facilitating the Parks Commission with its strategic planning. We had our second meeting this week, and she's committed herself to some more meetings in the fall. But a lot of progress has been made with the commissioners looking at their role and the staff role and a clear, more, much more clear mission and value statements. It was, it's been really good. And so you'll see some printed stuff from that. But the interaction has been really good, especially as we're making this transition from Jeff leaving and going into new staff. Uh, the MTIC is, is meeting uh, this July 2nd, which is really hard on the holiday. So I'm en encouraging them to think about postponing the calming traffic calming study discussion until <coughs> August. But we will be keeping you posted on that and on where Berlin Street sidewalk is because it is in the capital improvement plan. And the other statement that Ashley knows is that the Central Vermont Public Safety Authority has canceled its meetings until August. We're waiting for our communication committee to come back from their RFP out for simulcasting radios. So there's some uh, major happenings within the Public Service Authority with the staff change and also with the chairmanship. So it's a little rough period right now, but keep you posted. Glenn, did you have something to add? Jack, too, I think, after me. Um, you're mentioning the Community Justice Center just reminded me that I should have uh, brought up, I know that they are looking for more volunteers, both for the Circles of Support and Accountability and for the um, Restorative Justice Panels. So uh, I've been on a COSA um, circle for uh, several months now, and it's really rewarding and very, very difficult, and we need uh, people to, to step up for that. So I encourage anyone who's interested to get in touch with Yvonne downstairs at the restorative. Would you explain what center. those initials are? I've I know. Center for, uh, I'm sorry, Circle of, a, of Support and Accountability is the COSA, and the Restorative Justice Panel is the other uh, thing that they're looking for volunteers for, both really valuable. I realized I neglected to mention something which I think is important. Um, people may know uh, Bill Newhall, who is one of the founders of Another Way, and he was uh, one a very important figure in uh, in the movement to 
provide um, advocacy and support for people, particularly people with uh, psychiatric diagnoses. And Bill died on June 13th, and uh, there will be a memorial uh, in his honor at the Unitarian Church on July 8th from approximately 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, Bill had a tremendous impact on the commu community, and uh, he should be, uh, his passing should be noted. Okay. Um, all right. So uh, I have a, a few things here. Um, so one is um, Caledonia Spears is opening on Saturday in public. Very exciting. Um, and uh, July 3rd, obviously, it's coming right up. Very excited. I, we, uh, we're going to put in a plug. You all are walking in the parade, Absolutely. right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm not going to carry a sign, though. OK. <laughs> I did check in with Jamie about a banner, um, so I don't know where we're at with that, but uh, hopefully uh, I do not plan on wearing a top hat <laughs> at this point. <laughs> per, I could. I don't think I will, though. Um, but you're all, hopefully you're all going to be there. Great. Okay. Just well, checking. Ciara. Yeah. Oh, love you, Ashley. Yeah, maybe not. Um, do you all want us to wear a different color hat, like a rainbow or something? Oh, my goodness. That'd be so fun. I don't know. Do you want to? We can we can coordinate that offline. Um, okay, so uh, you know that's next week. Oh gosh, it is next week. I don't want to think about it right now. Okay. Uh, also, uh, I just want to uh, check with Sue. I was going to um, talk about the the date for the public meeting about uh, uh, home energy labeling. That's ready to go, right? Yes. Okay, so uh, we did set a date to have um, the first uh, public conversation. Uh, about uh, the uh, possibility of uh, having ordinance regarding um, uh, home energy labels at the time of listing for sale uh, for uh, buildings. And so that date, uh, if I am not mistaken, is uh, August uh, 20th, which is a Tuesday at 6 p.m. And I believe we're planning on having that meeting here. Um, uh, so There'll be some background as to uh, the work that's been done, um, not just uh, statewide, but across the country, and um, sort of where we're at um, in the process, and um, what that could look like for us. Uh, and then hopefully get some input um, from anybody who's available. Um, so I'd love to have you all there. Um, if I have any indication that you know that we may have a quorum there, I just want to make sure that we warn it um, properly. I mean, I suppose we might as well. Um, what time on the twenty? Uh, Six o'clock. Uh, so, in any case, I um, hope you all can, can come to that. Uh, we, I do anticipate that there may be a, a few public meetings and then we'll end up with a, some ordinance language that gets recommended to this group um, and we should probably um, have a couple of meetings on that just in terms of uh, getting people uh, you know, briefed on, on background and then what the ordinance does. Um, so that's one thing. And then the other thing, I just wanted to give a quick update from the um, Energy Committee. Uh, at our last meeting, we had a, a really great um, presentation from the Energy Action Network. Uh, they have updated their website to have highly specific energy information about um, every municipality in Vermont. And so you could look up things like um, how much um, each municipality uses in terms of electricity or how many buildings have been weatherized or how many advanced wood heating systems they have or how many heat pumps they have um, and you can track it over time as well so what's the trend in terms of um, like how fast the uptake is in these technologies and um, you can also see a, a heat map and a ranking so um, like where there are a, a lot of for example electric vehicles and, uh, and then where are any particular municipality ranks per capita uh, in terms of um, any technology. So there's a lot of information there. As an energy nerd, I was thrilled and actually ended up writing my city page, um, highlighting some of that data. It turns out that we are excellent at um, weatherization um, and electric vehicles, but we can always, but, we're, but we haven't actually met, well actually it also um, solar generation as well, but we have not yet met our, um, the equivalent of 
a Montpelier scale Paris climate um, goal, but we're on our way and that is encouraging. So um, I would I just look for that, I suppose, in the bridge and then um, um, check out that website. It's great. That is it for me. John. Oh. Great. <laughs> yeah. Just a couple things. <clears throat> We are working on dates, which we should be able to hopefully even announce in Friday's packet for both the transportation forum that we talked about. We've talked to some of the participants. Uh, Greenmount uh, Transit is interested in participating. Uh, All Earth uh, Trains, Rail, whatever, is interested in participating. VTrans, we think, will be in. So we're trying to get um, get a date for that. Um, the council, I know, wanted it as a separate, not on a council night. And likewise, we're finalizing the process for the Barry Main um, to roll out, uh, and I think there are a couple dates set for that actually. Sue, is that right for Barry Main? I don't have those. We want to come. Can you tell us? Oh, uh, yeah, the, the Barry Maine public, public meetings. The, I might there. hang on. Okay. Let me see if I have them. I feel like I communicate. I feel a like bit. no, we do have them somewhere. Um, yes, July 25th at the Senior Center, and August 1st at the library. And what times? I don't know what time. <laughs> I barely knew the date. <laughs> but those are the dates anyway. We'll get, we'll get the times okay. Okay. Uh, with the idea that we'd come for the council to process all that on August 14th. Okay. And one of those is we think it's here. Or one's no, at, at the, the senior, senior center, center and then one's the library. Senior, because the two major changes proposed are the Barry Street Corridor and then the School Street over by the library. So the thought was to have those in the areas where, right. where they might fall. Great. I spoke to you, I think, last meeting about uh, this build grant, which is a grant to look at rail. And we have, we've been in contact with All Earth Rail and, um, and City of Barrie, and it looks like the Regional Planning Commission is gonna take the lead. Uh, so Great. it doesn't have to come through the city, but they can take the lead for the grant application for and include both communities. So that's looking good. And um, we did. We have done some work. We, don't have, we expect to have a final report and recommendation about childcare at meetings. Oh, great. Um, well, it is great, and it's not. Um, <laughs> I mean, we think we'll be able to do something, but what, basically, we've been advised by anybody we've talked to not to do it, um, it for for a lot of good reasons. One, uh, we don't have a real good space here. Uh, we don't know the age range and the number of people that would be coming. Uh, our insurers were very uh, concerned about that. We have to, you know, we'd have to look at vaccinations. We'd have to look at a lot of, lot of factors. Uh, you know, do we have a licensed stake here? Do we hire someone? So what we're looking at, and I wanted to run this up the flagpole before we went too far, is to take the money that we had, and maybe uh, Yvonne came up with a really good suggestion, is maybe offer a $20 voucher, you know, for every, if you took, if you did $100 a meeting, technically we have 24 meetings, two per month. So it would be $2,400, we put 2,000 in the budget. And so if we had five $20 vouchers available on a given night, and you know, obviously if we had some big two hour meeting, we might consider looking at that. But and people would have to sign up in advance and obviously make some representation that you know, they didn't have a partner at home that could have watched the, you know, I, I mean, there's gonna be some sort of honor system there. Um, and then just let people, then they can hire their own child care in their own home, somebody their child kid knows, and we don't have the liability of doing that. So we're thinking through all the safeguards and how that might look, but we think that might be just the best way to accomplish the goal of allowing somebody to overcome a hurdle of attending a meeting without us having to take on a whole new pro program. So if that's okay, we'll f continue with that. That's okay with me. I also want to recognize that that is a fabulously creative solution to something that could have easily just been like a, no, we can't do that. So thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes. <clears throat> cool. That's it, eh? That's it for me. Okay, so uh, without objection, we are going to adjourn the meeting at 948.